you know, you got European civilizations, you got American civilization, and you look at where we are now. And then Have ours, they been civilized? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> civilization really just means coming under military jurisdiction and law and rule. So it really don't have anything to do with the morality of a people. Right. And I think that's where a lot of people get it wrong. Like they think because you civilize, it makes you good. It doesn't. <laughs> it means you now come under those structures, rules and laws, and you are under the threat of military jurisdiction, mm -hmm. might and power. Otherwise, you cannot participate in that society. Mm -hmm. So it's more, it's civilization is assimilation, mm -hmm. you understand me? And it has its part to play in, especially as you're building, you know, organized societies mm -hmm. and you have specific goals for that society and people have to play by particular rules. Now, whether those rules that they play by and the goal is good or not will be representative of the rules that people play under that consider themselves civilized to be good or not. Mm -hmm. And whether that has anything to do with morality mm -hmm. at all. Because for the most part, it doesn't. Right. Like we look at America, um, slavery for them was considered civilized. Right. Like that was part of civilized society that the average person would build their wealth literally on black bodies. Peace family is 19 Keys tapping in with another high level conversation. Today, I brought a very powerful, popular guest that you may have seen already. You understand me? This human being has been all across the planet doing good. Um, the, 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 the brother is really unique, you understand me, in the way that he composes his thought process and that he shows off his work to the world. He's not just somebody who speaks about making change, but he's a person that has manifested change right in front of the reality in the eyes of the people. He's been given BET awards uh, for being, you know, a good humanitarian and activist all across the planet. Um, he's created businesses. He is the go-to person that celebrities look for when they want to tap into their consciousness from Rihanna to Beyonce to, you know, anybody I'm pretty sure that you can think of most likely knows the good brother Shaka Bars. Not only has he found himself fighting for charitable goods, you understand me, to creating his own team of people who do athletic workouts. I'm talking about like three to 5,000 push-ups a day. <laughs> you understand me? Or you might even catch your girlfriend watching him eat fruits, you understand me, with his Fruits and Roots, you understand me, campaign that he does where he gets people around the world to actually eat better, you understand me? And a fruit diet is a much better diet than a meat and sugar and all of the other chemicals that we put in our bodies. So everything you see around his platform is a very powerful and positive, you understand me, movement. And at the same time, we don't shy away from controversy when it's time to speak truth to power, regardless of what systems, institutions that he's speaking of. And for that reason, I have a very powerful, dangerous brother straight from the UK. Shaka Boss. Bless. Thank How you, you for feeling, having brother? me here. <laughs> yeah, man, good. That was a, uh, you know, if I introduce myself, I just say, oh, I'm a developer. Yeah, I just yeah. Say, oh, I'm a developer. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get into it. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not good at introducing myself and talking about myself, but I've learned I'm better at doing it for other people. Uh -huh. You understand me? If I take the compilation of things that I see, um, hear about or read that's true, it's easy for me to piece together what the world knows about them. Mm. And the high level conversations is more so digging into their mindset and seeing what more value that we can impart on the world by ciphering. Mm. You understand me? Because I don't do interviews, I do conversations. Mm. <laughs> um, and mostly because I think that um, building in a conversation and creating a cipher, you know, you create new universes when you talk to people that have insight and knowledge that you don't have to where you both then composite thought and add value to that conversation. Mm. You know, where I want to start with you, of course, I want to go straight to the motherland. I want to start in Africa. Um, Africa is a place that, you know, we start to see uh, boom happen in the later 2000s. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Where most countries had they boom much earlier than that. Mm -hmm. But Africa is a place where it's not only having um, a, you know, what a person would consider a tech boom. Mm -hmm. It hasn't gotten to inflection point proportions, but also a population boom, mm -hmm. right? Where the average person is 19 years old and they're gonna be able to double their population size in the next 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are afraid of that and other people see investment opportunities in that, mm -hmm. right? So you see China, Europe, and other countries consistently over there building up the tech infrastructure because they understood that, 
you know, Africa um, is going to be, you know, for me, I think you see Africa in 2050, 2060, and I can just imagine Africa as this beautiful, you know, um, tech, but at the same time, organic center of like, and, and I think that there can be a completely new model that's mm-hmm. built in Africa, not old existing system worlds. And for a lack of better comparison, and I know you don't like this word, but mm-hmm. Wakanda, you understand me? But Wakanda, I think, gave people a mental image of what it would look like if we built our own world, mm-hmm. right? Like even in the movie, the black girl in Marvel is supposed to be the smartest person on the planet. Mm-hmm. You understand me? Smarter than uh, Tony Stark, the mm-hmm. billionaire white man. And so it did justice in that arena of, for the first time, Mm -hmm. a lot of black people had their first glimpse of, oh, this is what a black world would look like. Mm. You know, with some black rituals and language and colors and what even when we do science laboratories, there was graffiti on the wall. Mm -hmm. And I like the movie specifically for that reason because it was good imaging and programming in the brain. Mm -hmm. You understand me? What do you see as the future for Africa, based on your comings and goings, your building, your talking to the elders, talking to government officials, and also just the plans that you have? Um, well, they say that the 1800s was the time of the British Empire. The 1900s was the American Revolution and the military industrial complex that came out of that. Uh, 2000s is, is Asia's time, and then I believe the 2100s onwards is going to be Africa's time just mm. because all of the 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 previous civilizations that I mentioned have all developed off the back of Africa. Right. So Africa has been notoriously underdeveloped. Um, one of my favorite books by Walter Rodney is called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Mm. He was actually murdered. He was a Guyanese um he was a Guyanese author and he was actually murdered because he was creating a people's revolution in Jamaica and then in Guyana. But one of the, the, one of the major things that he did is he was a lecturer in the University of Tanzania. And um, what he had kind of, what he had kind of laid out was exactly how Europe developed to how it is based on Africa. For instance, like um, Firestone, the tire company, bought nearly a million acres of land for like a dollar a dollar on the acre Damn. that they still own today of rubber plantations and that's how they were able to develop to where they are and so i think you know the idea that mm. wakanda coming out of the minds of a few people but not out of the minds of africans in africa that's the issue right right but then having a billion dollar kind of um, or a, a multi-million dollar, I think it was 200, 300 million dollar production mm-hmm. put behind it and then all the marketing that came out of it. Though it's questionable at the time when I was kind of promoting it because I took around 2,000 students to go and see that movie in uh, Ghana, New York, uh, the UK and um, Jamaica. I took all these students to go and see it just so I could have a conversation with them afterwards of what they believe is the future of Africa because I took all you know, indigenous, Afro-American, Jamaican, Ghanaian students to go and see what that idea of Africa is. And they were like, wow, they never even thought about that because Mm. in Africa it's under development and then in the colonies, be it the UK or the USA or even in Jamaica, it is miseducation of what Africa is. Um, So... Right now, Ethiopia is at 11.9% GDP annually. So Ethiopia is the fastest developing country in the world, right? And there are many countries in Africa, out of nine out of the 14 fastest developing countries in the world actually exist in Africa. Because of this underdevelopment that's happened, now it's Africa's time to develop. It would have developed, and let's say it would have developed. It was the most developed and advanced civilizations anywhere in the world before Mm -hmm. colonialism, be it the trans-Saharan trafficking by the Arab Muslims or be it the the transatlantic trafficking and colonialism by the Euro-Judeo Christians. At at the time in 1650 when um, uh, Portuguese and French explorers were going to Congo, Congo had embassies in Italy and it had one of the best and most developed civilizations in the world at the time 
this whole idea that Europeans are kings and queens is, do you swear on this or you don't swear? Are we higher than the swear? Oh, no, you can, you know, speak your language. All right, that's some bullshit where they're talking about their kings and queens in Europe. The only way that they were able to develop into kings and queens was by copying Africans and stealing from Africans. They made our kings and queens who were administrators of of municipalities and, and land kingdoms and empires in Africa, they made us chiefs while they were they became kings and queens from mm -hmm. our wealth. And so I think if you start to look at how Africa was underdeveloped and how it got to where it is, and you remove that that colonial imposition from Africa, which is what is happening during the period in the 60s and the 70s of decolonization of Africa, and you get back to, you know, essentially, you know, whether it's Nigeria or Ghana or, or Eth not Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a bit different, but um, Tanzania, these, these countries are only 50, 60 years old, right? And so then you have all these Europeans trying to compare what is going on now, for instance, in Congo to where Europe is at. Let's talk about LGBTQ. They're trying to say, it was interesting, I watched an interview with the president of Ghana and they were trying to say, why, because there was like some, some LBGTQ movement in, in Accra and the Ghanaian government shut it down because it wasn't popular in Ghana. It wasn't a popular mm, movement right. in Ghana because they're very heavily influenced by Christianity, which was brought to West Africa by Europeans. And they were saying, you, the, 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 I think it was an interviewer from the UK was saying, the journalist was saying, you can't um, in your right mind say that you have a democracy and at the same time you're not acceptant of accepting of people's uh, gender dispositions or gender identities or wh how, whatever they, that, that, that they were saying because the Ghanaian government and the police shut it down. They tried to have it. They tried to do it in Jamaica as well. And the Ghanaian president was just like, what you were going through when your country was 60 years old, you had child labor, you had tyranny, you had all of these things <laughs> yeah. that we don't have. Right. You're trying to impose on us something that is not culturally acceptable now based on your rate of development that's been developed off the back of us. Mm. So even the idea of what, even me and you as melanated men of the world, what we want for Africa is still tainted with an education that is not African. And mm. when you actually sit and speak to people in Africa, they have their own ideas, their own values, their own standards, their own culture that's been gone back a long time and you just remove that that colonialism and they'll thrive <laughs> like they take over the world mm. that's that's very very interesting you said a lot of different points in that um specifically even getting to the last points about our education being tainted in our perspectives you understand me like and then at the same time looking at you know you got european civilizations you got american civilization and you look at where we are now. And then Have ours, they been civilized? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> civilization really just means coming under military jurisdiction and mm -hmm. law rule. So it really don't have anything to do with the morality of a people. Right. And I think that's where a lot of people get it wrong. Like, they think because you civilize, it makes you good. It doesn't. <laughs> it means you now come under those structures, rules, and laws, and you are under the threat of military jurisdiction, might mm -hmm. and power. Otherwise, you cannot participate in that society. Mm -hmm. So it's more, it's civilization is assimilation, mm -hmm. you understand me? And it has this part to play in, especially as you're building, you know, organized societies mm -hmm. and you have specific goals for that society and people have to play by particular rules. Mm -hmm. Now, whether those rules that they play by and the goal is good or not will be representative of the rules that people play under that consider themselves civilized to be good or not. Mm -hmm. And whether that has anything to do with morality mm -hmm. at all. Because for the most part, it doesn't. Right. Like we look at America, um, slavery for them was considered civilized. Right. Like that was part of civilized society that the average person would build their wealth literally on black bodies. Right. And the accumulation of black bodies as a workforce effort mm -hmm. so that they can produce and do more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but to that point, though, I was just thinking about the short time span that African countries have been alive and like, let's say America. And America with this four, almost going on 500 year history of utilizing slave labor, mm -hmm. right? To build this country, slave labor, war, and all other sort of schemes that we know in America. 
um, and, and as we go through these different industrialized ages. So when you speak about the sexual liberation mm -hmm. after a country has had 500 years of doing all of these other different things to mm -hmm. get to this point, right? Like even with white women being liberated now mm -hmm. um, to be in more position and getting paid more, like they men had 500, <laughs> 500 year yes. head start oh, right. of, let us build this, then we can talk about your rights. Right, like right, that's right. literally how it went. Right. So it's like, when you look at what's necessary, I guess, for a, a country to thrive in this age, day, and time, is it does have to go through those birth pains. Mm. Now, it definitely should never go through it in a manner that America and European colonized or uh, civilization, so-called civilizations, have done it. Mm -hmm. But the grace period and looking at countries going to that point where, you know, they have their great economies and they have their great schools and you know they're self-sustained and you start developing these other liberties that people within that society take and demonstrate as rights those things don't usually come until people are comfortable mm. like no poor people is fighting for sexual rights they're fighting for food they're fighting for food <laughs> nobody at war is thinking about you know rights they trying to win the war mm. so rights themselves are privileges of the comfortable you understand me? Particular type of rights. When you, I ain't talking about like food rights and human rights, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about when you get into, you know, the sexual liberation aspect mm -hmm. of it. That doesn't happen until a society gets to a comfortable point. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Even America takes where we are and we propagate that to the rest of the world and then they take on those movements. Mm -hmm. And sometimes their society has not gotten to that comfortable point where the legislators and politicians and people can even listen to that because they like, y'all want to be like Americans, but Americans are ahead of us. Right. Right. And so Africa has to look at its own situation. And I know that that happened with Obama. Obama went over there and he tried to campaign for LGBT rights. Mm -hmm. And they was like, it's not going to happen, brother. Right. It's not where we at. Mm -hmm. It's not something we asked for, not something we even sought out as a problem. We have a lot more things first mm -hmm. before we even consider that to be an issue. And all of the leaders in Africa who are not sellouts don't rate him at all. Mm. And the reason why they don't rate him is because his administration murdered Gaddafi. So whatever anybody wants to say about, and it's that neo-colonial with a brown face on it, kind of paternalistic idea of what Africans should do, the reality is that now in this country, LBGTQ has become the biggest social justice movement in this country. And in the 70s, it used to be black pride. Now it's just pride. And the black power fist is now absorbed by a rainbow flag, which is now signifying those different gender identities or sex sexualities. And my thing is, is how, how are we now in a time where, and personally, I don't care what anybody thinks of what I think, because regardless of what I say, black people, Afro-American indigenous people are still the biggest sufferers of all economic depravities, mm -hmm. mass incarceration, drug, food addiction, ev everything. How has that now been defunded further than it was, you know, than ever before? And now a movement that doesn't do anything really for black economy and also especially mm. important black trade relations or African or Afro-Indigenous trade relations and agreements between Afro countries, countries of South, uh, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, Africa, and then Black America. It doesn't do anything for those trade agreements. And huh, sex is not going to set us free. What is going to set us free is having economic prosperity. So how now has that flipped and that's now become First, it was like black pride, and it's like, yeah, right on, brother. Right, 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 right. And now it's like we are speaking about the identity politics of, of a people who aren't trying to foster trade agreements between countries where this country is building its wealth from. And if you want to really get into it, we need to talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary economies. And we keep talking about entertainment, which is a product of a third economy, the tertiary economy. And it's like you can't have a thriving entertainment industry until you have a solid primary economy, a solid secondary economy, 
and then the tertiary economy of, of um, goods and services comes. Primary economy being mining, agriculture and division of labor. Secondary economy being um, manufacturing. So you've got the resources now and you've made something from those resources. And then tertiary economy being like, well, now we've got all of this stuff, we can do stuff with it. We, as a people all around the world now, because of the marketing that has been given to us by the US corporation, um, we now, as, as young men, we are taught that actually the coolest that we can ever be is an entertainment for somebody else, mm -hmm. not farmers. Now the idea, I sat down with a, with a brother um, a few weeks ago, he calls himself the gangster gardener, Ron Finley. And he's like, we ain't free until we get back to farming. And I know from the studies that I've done that we weren't all kings and queens in Africa. We were mainly farmers. And that was what allowed us to be able to build civilization. Now we have this whole idea that we are the products of people that have been colonized and enslaved. And now in order for us to get back to our sovereignty, we have to become kings rather than first becoming farmers and, and pastoralists mm, and the things key. that made us rich. That's, that's super key. I think, yeah, no, people definitely want to go to royalty before the work. Right. You understand me? Like, even if, you know, I just recently came from um, Kemet, Egypt, mm -hmm. you understand me? Um, and when you think about that, first of all, I got this new notion about ego after I came from Egypt. Mm -hmm. After seeing the statues that they had of themselves, mm -hmm. Um, I'm talking about, you know, 100 foot statues. Two of them. Two the of them, <laughs> four women on the side of them. I say, man, y'all think we got an ego in America right. as black men? Like, you know, I think now my thing is, I don't think we have a big enough ego, mm. you know? And really the reason I say that is because, you know, every time we do get grand ideas that get crossed by society and we become right. considered crazy who right. are you to think that big of yourself right and to have that much of a vision of yourself and also to worship yourself right right because to worship your own reflection is also just the appreciation of creation itself mm -hmm. right like i'm not saying i created myself mm -hmm. but i am appreciative of the creator for creating me mm -hmm. right but what they was able to do during that time is they were able to get, number one, they was able to feed their people mm -hmm. because they knew how to utilize astronomy and they knew how to utilize the Nile River for mm -hmm. agriculture and they was able to feed their people to give them a certain standard of living. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, the kings or the pharaohs and the leaders at that time did have a vision, mm -hmm. um, they could get a collective group of people to work for that vision because they were supplying their standard of living. For 30 yeah. years to build one, <laughs> one structure. Like imagine today if we say, yo, I'll give you food, clothing, and shelter. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And I just need you to work for me. Like, look, we about to build this building. Yes, it's gonna have a big statue of me on there. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm a, you, know, you good though. Right. Or you gonna work. And probably be like, you know what? I work. You right. know what I'm saying? Every single day they happy, they taken care of. Mm -hmm. Right? Like the rule number one, if you're going to have a thriving society, civilization, you have to take care of your people. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And whoever can give those people the greatest standard of life, they're gonna go towards that person. Mm -hmm. But anyway, to that point though, as I'm looking at the ancient Egyptians, I say maybe our visions and our egos not big enough for us to be able to rule the world. Because mm. if you think about the egos of those who rule the world, they build everything in their image. Right. Everything to represent them, everything for their worship. Right. You understand me? I mean, and they look, still do now. Still do now. It's just different faces on it. Look at Donald Trump. Donald Trump built his Trump Towers. Everywhere. Everywhere. I was in India. There was Trump Towers in India. And he became <laughs> president. Right. So it's like, you know, early age, somebody would have been told Trump to be humble. He would have never became president. Right. Right. You said that to the same Rockefellers and all these other families to be humble. They would have never gotten to their position of power. Mm -hmm. Now, given these are terrible examples to use, right? right. <laughs> terrible examples to use. But to that point, we don't have one example of a black family that's made it to that upper echelon of power and rulership in modern day. Mm -hmm. You understand me specifically like in America, but even across the diaspora mm -hmm. that has really pushed their name out there, got people to understand and you know, worship they last name, because that's what being a celebrity is. Mm -hmm. It's obsession, it's worshiping, mm -hmm. right? 
is praying. Mm -hmm. it, 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 that's what you're communicating and you're producing this mass frequency to where you have an entity that's powerful. Mm -hmm. But we don't produce enough visions um, and we don't have an ego big enough that's inflated enough to believe that we can do it. Mm -hmm. We talk about Kanye West, Kanye West seemingly to have a, a, a pretty big ego. Mm -hmm. You understand me? But what has he done with it? Mm -hmm. Now it can put you on a crash course or it can make you a legend. Right. And a legend is the assets we leave behind. Mm -hmm. Right. So like a legacy rather. So we talked about a few things when you talk about the LGBT community, they have a pretty big ego. Mm -hmm. They have, but beyond that, they have organization structure mm -hmm. and they're a corporation. And an agenda. And an agenda. Mm -hmm. And you cannot do anything without those things. So it's like, we always come back time and time again when you see people in position of power, look at how they got there. What was their blueprint, mm -hmm. right? Because they're able to politicize their movement. Mm -hmm. They're able to uh, do it strategically, economically. They're able to uh, organize events around it, lobbyism. In they've, every aligned, aspect, they've aligned it with power. They aligned it and it's now, coded it's with now power. federally funded. And we have not been able to align our movements with those echelons of power to allow us to be accepted. This episode is brought to you by Goldwater. And that's what we've always been missing, mm. you know, is structure. So it's like when you talk about economics, though, you know, you've been. Uh, around the world and you've seen different systems and recently we talked about Sadhguru mm -hmm. and the system that he created over there of you know economic volunteerism mm -hmm. you know and that being a sustainable model to be able to build out you know a, a world system mm -hmm. and have people work together and create a new idea of monies and currencies mm -hmm. what was it that you witnessed and how did you link up with Sadhguru in the first place? Um, one of my, my friends, uh, a brother called Che he is managing kind of a lot of the promotional stuff for one of Sadhguru's movements that he's doing now, which is Save Soil. And what Sadhguru is saying is, and what all the oceanographers and, and scientists are saying is that within 30 years time, there's going to be no soil with three to six percent of organic mass, mm. micro, um, uh, microbiology or micronutrients in the soil that will allow soil to exist. And we won't have soil anymore. We're just gonna have sand and dirt. Um, and Che linked me up with him because he's just like, a lot of the stuff that you're speaking about, this man has already done in India. So I went to India to go and see what he's done. And what he's done is amazing. He, he has uh, on about 800 acres of land, he has 5,000 volunteers living there. He has a, a temple, uh, yoga, ashram, uh, accommodation for volunteers, accommodation for conferences, uh, accommodation for people going on, there on holiday. He and his organization, the Isha Foundation, has planted 62 million trees in the last 25 years. And I'm like, where's that in Africa? So I'm like, well, I'm going to link with people in Africa and I'm going to make that possible. What's his economic structure called? Um, he has a few, but basically it's a foundation where for instance, how he's able to plant so many trees is he takes donations from people and he also sells, he has like an online web series. So imagine like, have you heard of Gaia? Mm -hmm. So Gaia is like the, the, conscious, the, the, the Netflix of consciousness, right? Sadhguru has his whole own channel that's just for his thing, mm. where he has like 30 or 40 different shows just about stuff that he's into, right? And that has a subscription model for okay. it. So he has that, he sells, you know, a variety of things, including copper bottles, yoga mats, and just uh, his whole inner engineering thing is, is basically giving people the technology to allow themselves to be their, high, their highest selves through different breathing techniques and meditations, etc. cetera. And uh, my thing is when we were back to some of the, back to Kemet that you were speaking about before, when we were in our highest vibration and um, not necessarily saying, say that, all right, so what you had said is that we had uh, a big ego, or we had a right. big enough ego. And, and to I was be being a little humorous about it. Right, but, right, right. right. Uh, there's some but, point of validity to it as well. No, there, there is. I mean, if you've got like two granite carved moved from a, a thousand <laughs> mile away, as one quarry all the way yeah. up to wherever you know, uh, uh, statues made of you. Yeah. 
and you have everybody speaking about you and yeah. your names ringing out a lot of the time. And then That's they had like, phallic symbols. Right. They had penises everywhere. Right. So, I, you know, you can imagine being a European coming here the first time, you know, and being envious. Mm -hmm. And then they woman's jumping out their skirt. You understand I me? Mean, they like, man, cover your eyes. Penis envy. And, yeah. Right. And then they knew from that point on they was going to have an issue with the black man. Right. But, but meanwhile, they erect the same... They're not called obelisks, they're called Tekkens. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they, they, they erect the, the Tekkens in every single major city that they have, whether it's London, whether it's Washington, D.C., the Louvre in front, they've got them all there. They're trying to, but this is the thing about them and us. And I'm not saying in particular I've got a problem with white people, but white culture, everywhere it's met us, has destroyed us. It hasn't elevated us. So now you don't have in white culture creation, you have recreation. Mm. And the problem with recreation is that all you're doing is appropriating. Recreation is just a nice name for appropriation, mm -hmm. right? And you're appropriating and misjudging cultures that are based on spirituality, where you have this idea that all the books, these self-help books that are coming out from Europeans now are how to rule and dominate. They're like how to rule and dominate and how to make as much money as possible. You have like the 48 laws of power. You have, you have these books that are based on the 42 laws of Ma'at. You have the Ten Commandments that is based on 42 negative proclamations or confessions of Ma'at, which are based on spirituality. So when you now have uh, a, whole, a whole society being built on spirituality, Europeans come in and say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's, that, that, that's, that's them flexing, and right. we're going to flex ourselves, but you cannot flex properly without spirituality because that flex is completely debased from what then followed which is rampant advanced capitalism which was just a recreation of or what they thought was a recreation of what was going on in Africa because personally I think the best systems that we had for peace were communalism from communalism came feudalism and this is where the idea of kings came from and then from there came imperialism and empires and all this stuff. And I don't believe that necessarily in human spirituality, it is the height of our purpose or our calling to try and organize our people underneath rulership or leadership of some people's ideas that aren't beneficial for all. I don't think that necessarily we're supposed to have massive cities, right? Because now what we've seen with massive cities and capitalism and capital cities being built on the coast of all areas of the world is the deficits that it creates in the rural areas where all of this wealth is generated from, right? So you have this idea that what we are supposed to do, as in, I say we as in human people, is we are supposed to continue to recreate aggressive systems that destroy everything apart from ego, right? They really prop up ego, you know, you pull mm -hmm. up in the whip, you've got the, you got the jewelry, you've got the big houses, you've got all of these things, and it's like propping up your ego. But at the same time, you go into the jungles where all this stuff is being taken from and it's like destroyed, right? You're just literally collapsing mm. ecosystems so that we can have ego systems, right? right? And I think, for me, the idea of Wakanda and having spent a lot of time in Congo is an idea of what can an, an advanced civilization look like or what can the future of humans look like without these systems of ego, but with these systems of eco, mm -hmm. right? Because there's no reason why we have to create things that have deficits. For instance, plastic. Plastic is one of the most used materials in the world right now but you can grow it from a plant, like you can make it from hemp, right? Yeah. And it will biodegrade within 18 months. It will be completely gone, reabsorbed into the earth. But what we have is we have these systems of petroleum and, and uh, Vaseline. Like, mm -hmm. like look, look at this marketing campaign, right? You got all the, girl, all, all, all the girls, all the women in the hood right now putting Vaseline on their lips because that's what they think keeps their lips moisturized. Meanwhile, Vaseline is a byproduct of shell, BP and these aggressive uh, 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 fossil, fossil fuel, these aggressive systems of capitalism where the waste products of that system is Vaseline. So when you refine oil, what happens is oil is, is refined and 
you have different levels of octane, all the way from crude, all the way up to like kerosene, which is, um, you know, you see it on the pumps where it's like 87 octane, yeah. 88 octane, 90 octane, jet fuel, which is, is kerosene. And then what you have that remains on, the, on these huge vats is you have this jelly that is just waste shit that they can't sell. Marketing, here comes the marketing, here comes the Edward Bernays, we're gonna put this in the thing and say that you need it for all of these things to be beautiful. But really what you're doing is you're putting it on yourself, you're drying out your lymphatic system, you're drying out your uterus, you're giving yourself fibroids and they're benefiting from it. So I think that what we need to start to do is look at ways of being able to create value without creating deficits. I like that. I mean, of course that will only exist when the ego of those who run the world is no longer there. Right. Like as long as the people who run the world don't have empathy and don't mm -hmm. care about those who they devastate, they hurt the carnage that they create because they create a system of chaos because mm -hmm. they can they can feed and live in that chaos. So as long as the people down bottom are in a chaotic system then they can control them mm -hmm. the moment they become present mm -hmm. and focused. I was talking to my bro Mike Rashid earlier about this is that, you know, anytime somebody say something truly profound. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they talk about like just the key to everything. They always get in this very calm tone. Mm -hmm. And they like, you know the best thing to just be mm -hmm. is to be. Mm -hmm. Is to just enjoy and live. Mm -hmm. And the reason you get to that point because if all people on the planet Earth got to that tone, mm -hmm. you know, of relaxation and present, mm -hmm. then they would have realization. Mm -hmm. Like, wait a minute, I am here. I am God, this is my planet, we can decide to change all things all at once. Mm -hmm. But most people's energy is in this chaotic field all the right. time, distracting, you know, uh, 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 constantly overexcited, mm -hmm. you know, too much dopamine and serotonin and your whole, the whole world is high. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what the conversation I had earlier is like, I heard my, uh, Samuel Jackson talking about, you know, back in his days in the 60s and 70s, he was saying that, you know, they did all sort of drugs. They did all sort of psychedelics and things of that nature. They got high, mm -hmm. right? He said we were drug users. Then it got to a point where they the took drug all of the psychedelics with just heroin. He said that killed the movement. Right. And then nowadays we are, we have to be the biggest drug using, you know, era in the history of the planet where we have all sort of drugs. We mm -hmm. got the psychedelics, we got the weed, we got the ketamine, mm -hmm. you understand me? We got caffeine, mm -hmm. we have social media, we have all sort of weeds that we can think of. We have sugar. We got sugar, we got <laughs> CBD, we have Vicodin, pharmaceutical, like we got more drugs than any other point in time that man has ever to choose his taking. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Crack, heroin, PCP, right? Um, Ketamine, ADHD, where people utilize uh, Adderall. Man, these are all kind of drugs out there that people utilize. Um, liquor, you know, weed. People are addicted to so many different things, right? And the average person that wants to quit, they can't. They don't have control over their own will, right? Which means they don't have control over their own way and their own destiny, and they're enslaved to the things that they take. Now, how do you gain control over self? Of course, there's a mental function, but there's also a biological function as well. See, oftentimes when we're addicted to something, we crave it. There's a excitement, and that excitement is, if you will, an electrical spike, right, in our brains. We automatically think that if I get that, I'll be rewarded with the pleasures. So your brain is operated based on what it feels, not what it thinks. You understand me? The moment you think of that drug, it is inducing a small chemical in the brain to make you feel that same pleasure that you will if your will continues to go towards manufacturing and producing and manifesting that drug into your reality. Putting you in this cycle, want and will, desire and action consistently. How do you disrupt that? Well, if I want something, but I have a stronger will than the things that I desire, and I can disrupt that, and biologically I also have the capabilities within because my body doesn't crave something because it no longer needs it. Meaning that it's already at an electrical spike of activity, right? You already high off energy. So therefore you say, nah, I don't need the drink. Nah, I don't need the coffee. My willpower is stronger. See, in the 19th century in the UK, they utilized gold as a way to curb addiction. 
right? Now this was a necessary process and they still utilize gold today in cancer treatments and tumor treatments and all sort of different ways that they utilize gold. The ancient people knew the recipe. They knew how to utilize the elements of the world to take control and power over self. Imagine if you had the greatest electrified operating system in the world and you can begin to control your own will. We've had great testimonials from people who are addicted to weed, people who are addicted to liquor, people who are addicted to coffee, and they've all been able to start to begin to take control of their own will and curb these addictions. And they believe that the assistance of the gold allowed them to be able to tap into that higher mode instead of being controlled by their lower selves. Now they're so electrified, it's their higher mind that is in hyperdrive. Make sure y'all tap in, get on the gold, stop being controlled by your addictions and your afflictions. Instead, make gold a part of your new ritual. Tap in. And all of these things constantly keeping us in this high state, mm -hmm. right? But when are we actually present? You understand mm -hmm. me? And that sober mind thinks differently about reality. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And without us actually ever being sober, we can always be taken advantage of in those high states mm -hmm. because you're more open, mm -hmm. you're more sensitive, mm -hmm. and so you're going to intake more of that vibration and frequency mm -hmm. that's being put. And we know fear is probably one of the biggest control mechanisms on the planet. I talked about this with Billy Carson. So the sober thought, as we talk, like high-level conversation is a sober thought. It's mm -hmm. like you got to actually be present and listen to what the brothers is talking about mm -hmm. or sisters is having in these conversations, ciphers and builds. Because you talked about a lot of different things that I think are primary and key. That if, you know, getting rid of white patriarchal intellect that is at the helm and looking at how they run systems based on power, control, manipulation, rulership and chaos, and then replacing that with the maotic systems of truth, order, balance, justice, freedom, equity, equality, reciprocity, that's a completely different business model, mm -hmm. right? And business, as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan kind of says, is the activity of life. Mm -hmm. So the way I think about business, we will always do business, mm -hmm. you understand me? We always do trade, we always do barter. Money will always be a system, but it doesn't mean that the currencies that we use um, are systems that aren't worth anything, right? right? I'm watching this show, and uh, it's a very interesting show. I got to remember what it's called, but it's about um, two black people. One is an alien. He comes down from the stars. Mm -hmm. And this brother, and he ended up knowing how to write Sumerians. Like, it's very interesting, because if you go listen to, like, some of the conscious community, and how they talk about Sumeria, even uh, Billy Carson, it was like a play out of everything we, we spoke about or everything they talk about, but they actually made a show about it now. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that he came down there, well, he came down from his planet with gold mm -hmm. because the gold was a universal money, mm -hmm. right? Like on his country, they couldn't make dollars to counterfeit, but he knew that if he brought gold, he can easily go to a pawn shop and then trade it. Now that's a valuable commodity mm -hmm. that people consider to be God's money. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are building systems, you know, and you have somebody like Sadhguru who said didn't utilize money, but he had media and he had a revenue stream, mm -hmm. you know, and that media allows you to have more control and navigate the consciousness of the people. And the revenue allows you to be able to build out the ideas that you want. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And now we're in this economic crisis to where we're in the middle of a recession um, because we're going on month two of uh, economic downturn. Mm -hmm. um, and now the question about what is money comes into play. So as we mm -hmm. talk about you know, creating sustainable economic systems, right? And doing it ethically, mm -hmm. right? Without the ego, without the king's disease, mm -hmm. you know, what does the money look like, number one? Mm -hmm. And how far off do you believe that we are from, I ain't gonna say we, cause if you say do it in America, that's a thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go somewhere without an existing infrastructure, then you can just build in place. Mm -hmm. But then the threat of protecting the system that you build is always going to loom because if you create something successful, mm -hmm. every other system is now getting side-eyed. Mm -hmm. Like, why did you do it like them? Mm -hmm. You understand me? Mm -hmm. So that becomes a threat. So where would you build? What would be your money system? Mm -hmm. You understand me? Um, and how long do you think it would take to create something that's sustainable? And how would you protect it? Um, I would build across the tropics of the earth. Um, I think that that's the, the, the highest value in terms of quality of life and things that are able to be produced exist there. 
Um, I think that anywhere that the sun shines and there's humidity is where the melanated people uh, should thrive. Um, I think the money would look like... Um, it doesn't matter what the money looks like, it matters how it's regulated, right? Because there used to be cowrie shells in Africa, right? Um, the, the problem there becomes when one person or one family can now own all of that and then the, what is attached to that is infinite labor mm. to make their reality... Infinite labor. Infinite labor to make their, um, their manifestations a reality consistently for generations and generations. So it doesn't really matter what it is. Gold is a great one, you know. Uh, it, it has been a, a universal currency or let's say a planetary currency of Earth for thousands of years, right? Um, the problem with, with what currency has now become is that you had people who didn't have things in their lands come to foreign lands, which is Africa, India, South America, take dirt out of the land or take stones and minerals out of the land. They worship that now and destroy the people. And that's one of the biggest problems is where we, we are now... We, as a people, I say all people on earth are now worshipping people who don't know what they're doing and don't understand or don't overstand the way to be able to take care of, of the planet, right? So now, who are the most worshipped men on earth, apart from religious figures that have since transitioned or existed or didn't exist or whatever, are now... Elon, Gate, uh, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff mm -hmm. Bezos, and um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. These are the most worshipped men on the planet Earth, right? And they don't even have the wealth that the, the, the families that, that have helped them to get to where they are have. But these are the ones that are known. And these are the tech companies, right? I think what now looks like currency is technology and it is technology based on these systems of uh, manipulating electricity to create interfaces that are carbon based or earth mineral based so that we can now share information, right? Share information, share stories, you know, catch a vibe, people be on social media. This is, you know, the new socialization or a version of socialization without Congo the Democratic Republic of Congo, that it really isn't a republic and really isn't democratic. Without that country that has $24 trillion of these minerals in the ground, there is no wealth on earth right now, anywhere on earth. Every single government on earth now bases its wealth on the periodic table of minerals that can be extracted from Congo, right? So what it looks like for me is a sustainable economy is where you have this now, this new tech revolution, which is, it seemingly, it is, a, it is a, a revolution of earth that excludes the place where the minerals come from, right? So you have this tech revolution where data has now surpassed oil in value. But at the same time, the country where it comes from, which really isn't a country at all because there's so many different languages, it's the size of Western Europe. Congo has 80 million people in it, but it is too, 0.4 million kilometers squared, right? Mm. Where a lot of it is jungle. But the same minerals that are being extracted from Congo now have been found in Bolivia, have been found in Colombia, have been found in... It just seems like the jungle is where the real wealth and, and, and mineral wealth is coming from. Absolutely. And until you are able to be able to create a sustainable system that has ecology, sustainability, ethicality, People are paid fair wages, they have equity, they have uh, egalitarian systems based on the people where these minerals are coming from. There will be no peace on earth, I believe, until the countries where the wealth is coming from and the countries where the wealth has always come from are able to rule again. So what I would do, as there were in systems of old, I would put the black or the melanated woman at the top of all of these systems whereby she can create peace and balance where we can now create fierce leadership that is needed added added into that the protection that is needed is 
The same minerals that are being taken out of these countries and being manipulated into weapons of mass destruction and weapons of destruction. We need to not only own these weapons, we need to be trained on these weapons, we need to be fearless uh, when it comes to using these weapons to protect our people and to protect our systems. And if at which point the trade agreements become unfavorable, we need to completely disconnect and just create within our own economies, economies of scale that have nothing to do with anything to do with the West. Because let's be honest, this whole idea, you, you've heard of this capitalist idea of the free market, right? Mm -hmm. Bullshit. How is it a free market when the countries where all of these minerals are coming from are not free? It can't be a free market. Do you think that the two could coexist? Because why do you think that the fact, and there's two things I want to ask you thing you said about the black woman at the top of the hierarchy, and then two, you, you talk a lot about what happens in uh, Congo and how these companies mine and then they leave, you know, a path of devastation for the people that exist in those systems. Um, why don't you think that the two should be able to coexist where they mine, but then they take care of the people? Why don't you think that they actually do this? Why, why, why would it want to leave bad media, press, and the surrounding society, especially if you're making billions of dollars? It would, it would seem to at the, the minimum be fair to take care of the people mm -hmm. that's taking care of you. Mm -hmm. um, let me give a quick breakdown of Congo. So like post Kingdom of Congo and, and when the, uh, col the colonizers came into Congo and started enslaving people and taking them off to New Orleans and Jamaica and Brazil, uh, the, the biggest port for Congolese, enslaved Congolese people was actually Salvador de Bahia in Brazil. Um, uh, 1885, uh, the Europeans decided in a conference called the, uh, the Conference of Berlin, um, they decided, or the Berlin Conference, they decided that what they would do is they would divide up Africa as their personal wealth. One uh, evil, evil man who we would, who would, we would liken to an advanced version of, of, of uh, adult Hif Hitler. He was like, I would suppose, I would, I would say that he was Hitler, Hitler's mentor, probably without ever meeting him. I don't know if they mm. met or they didn't meet, but from 1885 until 1908, while Congo was under his personal rule, right. um, he and his administration killed 15 million Congolese people. Mm -hmm. So he over half, half the population of Congo for the production of rubber. Yeah, he was worse than Hitler. Way worse than Hitler. Um, it's just because the people that died looked like me and you, and I would say didn't even look like me and you, they were way darker than me and you in complexion. Because those people died, it's not something that's being taught in school, right? But what happened uh, was he basically organized the country and had railways built to extract this rubber and to extract wild ivory from elephants so that they could make piano keys. So everybody's got pianos, all these antique pianos in their house. That's like dead elephants. Mm. And then the tires at the time that were being made were uh, being made from the slave labor of Congolese people. Mm. And if they didn't meet the rubber quotas, which came every two weeks, then the wives of the, of the, of the men that they were kidnapping and putting in cages would then be raped, mutilated, have their hands cut off, mm. have their feet, feet cut off. And now in Belgium to this very day, you can go to chocolatiers and you can buy the hands and the feet as little chocolates. They'd only do them in brown and black dark chocolate and milk chocolate. They don't do them in white mm, chocolate. Belgium chocolate. Belgium, Belgium chocolate, which not a single cocoa tree grows in, in Belgium, right? And so 1908, the, the Belgian government was embarrassed by the atrocities that were being caused by King Leopold, even though Belgium was de developing off the back of it, and they took it over from 1908 until 1960. Well, they claimed that they didn't know everything that he was doing while benefiting economically right. from it. There's a, there's a place called the, I can't remember what it's called, the Sant Santaner something, Google it, someone Google it. But it's basically <laughs> like their big palace and all yeah. of their, 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 their royalty that was built and their great buildings that people now go still go to there for tourism for were built off the back of this slavery, which was 100% profit, of course. Yes. I mean, they just tore down the statue, was it 2020? Right, of Leopold. Yeah. It's like, all right, you, you got your, you know, 130 years of yeah. like aggrandization and now, only now, when right, we fully right. developed. And that is viral on social media. Right. Then we take it down. Right, so 1908 to, to um, 1960 uh, was the rule of the Belgian government and they had 
again, the same thing that Leopold was doing. Interestingly enough, if you actually study the history of Congo, it was actually Arab Muslims that were going into Congo from East Africa and uh, enslaving Congolese under the idea of the Holy Muslim Empire that allowed King Leopold of Belgium to go in and say, well, we need to Christianize them. So there was already slavery going mm. on in Congo by this point anyway. So like after the fall of the Kingdom of Congo, uh, kind of at the end of the 17th century, that was when like mass kind of enslavers came in first from, from uh, Arabia and East Africa uh, under, under the administration of uh, Mecca, Saudi Arabia, these places. And then afterwards it was King Leopold of Belgium that came in uh, after an explorer called Hen Henry Morton Stanley. Basically, they couldn't get through the whole of Congo coming from the West Coast because the Congolese River, uh, the, the River Congo is the deepest on earth and one of the most ferocious rivers on earth. And when you get to a certain point in land, it just becomes mountains and waterfalls and you can't get up there. So they had to actually come in from uh, Uganda and go that way. And when they found that there, there was actually a way that they could be able to take stuff from the jungles of Congo and then take it all the way to a place called um, Matadi or Boma, which is the west of Congo, and then take it up to Belgium and whatever. They were like, right, colonization time. So, they, so what Leopold had said is he was like, well, you know, we need to civilize these people. We need to bring right. them Jesus Christ and we need to civilize these people. And with this civilization comes, I need to rule the place. Right. So he ruled the place until, until 1960. In 1960, Patrice Lumumba, so May 1960. He rest in power. 1960, right? They ruled under brutal dictatorship um, and brutal colonialism. Till 1960, one of my heroes, Patrice Nomumba, may he rest in power. He brought the, the, the leaders, the king of Belgium at the time, to Congo, and uh, they were supposed to be given this kind of speech to be like, oh, we're handing you back the country and it's been a great partnership. And he basically said to them, no, fuck you. You destroyed our country. What you have done is all of these things and he humiliated in front of um, all of Congo and in front of all of the, 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 the superpowers that are watching ar around the world, including the United States. He humiliated them and um, they went, all right, bet. And then the next year they killed him. They had him murdered mm. and it was the CIA. And this is the thing where you know, there's a conversation that's being had right now with a few people saying, well, you know, what do what do, do, do black Americans have to do with black Africans, right? It's like people here were indigenous to here and we have nothing to do with, or I say, because I'm born in the Caribbean, which is part of the Americas, right? But what do North American indigenous black people have to do with America, uh, sorry, have to do with Africa? But I'm like, well, if the CIA has funded around 40 different military coups in Africa, of which the USA has benefited from, of which then African-Americans, though bottom of the barrel, bottom of the barrel here is not bottom of the barrel in Congo, right? Have then been able to benefit from, though it's the, the, the crumbs of colonialism, they've still benefited from it. Like this country is not gonna be invaded by any other country because plutonium and uranium from Congo has been turned into nuclear missiles. So like, you know, as, 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 a, as a man who lives in this country, and if you have an American passport, you know that you ain't about to be invaded by nobody else and nobody's about to have war in your country right now or this country right now because Congolese minerals are protecting you, right? Whereas Congo doesn't have that, that um, luxury. Look at South Africa when uh, Mandela was now made the, the leader of South Africa, the... South African government, which is a white racist apartheid government, had a nuclear missile program. They had mm -hmm. a nuclear program. As soon as Mandela came in, they sent that, that, that missile up to India. They're like, no, we can't have Africans who have, because of how much money, how much gold was being taken out of uh, uh, South Africa and being brought to North America. They're like, we can't have these Negroes or, or these Africans. Oh yeah, no, no hand we, on the button like that. No, we can't sure. have that. So when I'm, I'm looping all of this back round to saying protection is key, because if you can protect your resources, then you then have power. If you have resources but have no protection, you have no power. All That's you have fact. is exploitation. Now, Block World Order is an organization that is focused on blockchain technology, the future of skills, and the future of things. Right now, the world is going through a complete infrastructure change, right? And you will be a part of that change in the building phase. 
Not in the face where everything is built out, the rules have already been made, the, the money has already been made, and you're just stuck as a consumer, and you become the product again. Just like when we had well point oh, well point two, well point three. No, this time you get to create the rules by becoming one of the educated, by becoming one of the developers and becoming one of the early innovators and adopters of this new disruptive age of technological wealth that we are now going into. So you're going to be learning all of the skill sets and all of the knowledge you need to be up to date, not just you, but your family. Right. Everything from crypto to metaverse to blockchain technology to DAOs to Solidity coding program, how to create games and more. We want to make sure that you are involved in a full stack community where you can get everything all in one place. And on top of that, I will be teaching you the mental tools that I will utilize to shift my consciousness and to take me to the highest version of myself. Some people often say, well, I do not know how to learn. We will be giving you the tools so that you can mentally hack yourself and redesign yourself into the greatest version of who you are meant to be. We can help you tap into the universal laws of intelligence so that you are always in the flow state. If we're talking about going into a new shift in the world, then we also have to go into a new shift in consciousness. When we talk blockchain, it also has to be married with the spiritual intelligence of understanding because the human design is the most intelligent design in the world, yet we often know the least about it. So that not only will we be pairing this technological knowledge, but we'll also be pairing it with biological knowledge of understanding yourself. Block World Order will be the greatest institution for understanding and knowing yourself in the blockchain produced. I'm glad that you chose to be amongst our thriving and beautiful, great community. And I can't wait to see you on the other side as one of the builders of our new world. Tap in to Block World Order. Peace. I want to get to a point where you say, you say black Americans have benefited from essentially um, America's exploits in other countries, mm -hmm. which has fortified America to become a superpower. Mm -hmm. And because of the proxy of benefit by being in America, mm -hmm. then we now have a responsibility to do what? I feel like you have a responsibility to create fair trade agreements, but not between you and uh, 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 white folk and Africans, just between blacks here and blacks in Africa. I think you have a responsibility to be able to now with the... Because the thing is, is about us speaking an English language, which is a colonized language anyway. Us living in proximity to these systems of rule and control, we understand them. We know them inside and out. And we can now know how they work and now know what not to do when we create these trade agreements. I believe that. Arrangements. For because those who are educated... Right. Well, because there's a lot of us who exist in the systems, but are wholly ignorant of mm -hmm. the system and institution, mm -hmm. the way it works in itself. Mm -hmm. So who are mostly just victims of the system rather than who are actually educated on it. So when you export those people, there's no intelligence that follows. Right. Well, that's why I'm building schools, because we need to have a re-education or an education of systems that benefit us rather than systems that benefit them. Because now what about those in the UK, because do you, I mean, you got the, the crown itself, mm -hmm. right? You know, they done stole from every country they can possibly steal. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Um, and then, you know, the crown, if, if you go to the history of the world, right? Mm -hmm. They were given their powers essentially by the church, mm -hmm. right? And then you got the crown who basically gave their powers to America. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And so it's a trickle effect in the system mm -hmm. that we're all caught up in this global system of so-called white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? Or what you would consider more just so-called white institutions, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the way that these systems work. And so the same responsibility that will be imparted upon uh, black Americans, Moorish Americans, however people want to qualify the name, mm -hmm. you know, would be the same standard that will really be put on all people across the planet mm -hmm. Earth. You understand me? And because I know people going to be like, well, he's from the UK. How mm -hmm. could he? You would, wouldn't know what it was like to be a black American to grow up here mm -hmm. and to not know where you're from, but mm -hmm. to have to guess it mm -hmm. or to maybe do some genealogy, but only go so far. Mm -hmm. Right. And really to feel completely displaced on a planet with no real home. 
So we gravitate towards streets, corners, hoods, you know what I mean, states, because we don't actually know where we're from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was having a conversation with a sister because they was mad we utilized the word Nubia. And she was like, well, y'all not Nubians, y'all Americans. Y'all don't know where y'all from, blase, blase. And I was talking to Queen Diambia, uh, who was the inherited queen of the Congo from her father. And one of the things that was interesting, you know, the special thing about black Americans, because you don't know where you're from, you can claim it all. Right. <laughs> you know, and I, I subscribe to that idea. You understand me that the melanin is 196 million, 940,000 square miles on this planet. It's all ours. Mm -hmm. Right now, I can't take your culture. Right. Right. But I can love it. Mm -hmm. You understand me and appreciate it and say that somewhere, you know, in my DNA, um, as far as how I identify, I'm a part of that. Mm -hmm. You understand me now? Of course, you can be like, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can call it a form of appropriation. I think the unique perspective and position that black people in America have is that because of our last 400 years of slavery, we feel and we do have a certain privilege to all the world mm -hmm. because nobody in the world came and helped us. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, for everything that a person has an issue with, there's no country that can say, well, we tried to help y'all out of slavery. Mm -hmm. we, we knew that you all were over here. Now, one particular people can say they came and helped black Americans. Haiti did. Haiti, when Haiti became a republic, they said all black Americans that come, and anybody from any of the, the South America or Central America, are free when they get here. But, um, but that's, now that's, you know, a right, or something that was extended to it, but I'm talking about in the sense of, you military know. Military coming over. Military right. might, well, that's what we needed. That was, right. that was afterwards. Yeah, mm -hmm. when we get free, it's the whole part. Right. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is, is about that is that there was no military might that had organized its wealth and power anywhere on the earth, as well as Europeans, the French, the Spanish, and um, uh, the English had done to be, like the French Navy was the biggest military machine that ever existed for anybody to be able to rival them. So though we have stories of rebellions uh, in, in Africa, mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, etc., and we did defeat them many times, we, a, lot of, a lot of what was then done wasn't, it wasn't, didn't have the ability to be able to directly engage them in warfare. So, but there had to be a lot of, you know what? Black slaves in America is just the standard of the world that basically just became, that is what it is. Because there was conversations in politics and people talking about how, you know, evil it was, mm -hmm. but there was nothing progressive that happened where people did anything active. Like, let's see, we look at economic sanctions against Ukraine because, mm -hmm. uh, or Russia because of what they're doing to Ukraine. There was never any economic sanctions or anything that happened in, you know, last four or 500 years. I only say that just because Black Americans have a particular vendetta probably against the whole world because of that. You know, like, we, we, we're probably going to feel like that for a long time. I think probably when we have to, it's like a person that gets out of jail and a person that was locked up for 40 years and they only been free for 10, mm. you know, they've been slaves more than they've been free. Mm -hmm. And black Americans specifically, mm -hmm. you know, we've been slaves longer in this country than we've been free in this country from a known mm -hmm. history standpoint. So I think that you know, it's not that we, and then you had to say. It was June, June 19th, 1876. Yeah. 65. 65, 1865. And that was 1776, so they had this. We definitely July. weren't yeah, free. Yeah, yeah. But even to that point, it's like when so called slavery was over, mm -hmm. then we had sharecropping, mm -hmm. then we had Jim Crow laws, then we had redlining, then we had crack and heroin, mm -hmm. and we had the prison industrial complex. There was never an era, point in time and decade where we had a break. Mm -hmm. So our freedom was always came with stipulations that it was never truly free. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we talk about civilizations, as we talked about in Africa, that when you look at a people, and the same way the LGBT tried to go over there and be like, yo, establish this, and they fought back like, bro, we've barely been free or we've barely been established. Y'all have had all this time. Mm -hmm. That's how black Americans are. Mm -hmm. Like, we haven't really had the time to be comfortable to really establish. Mm -hmm. So I think that what you see is the insulation of focus comes on to say that, well, until we actually establish ourselves here, mm -hmm. then we don't actually have the ability to help anyone anywhere else. 
unless there's trade agreements and or programs that stimulate That's both at the say. same time. There's no way that you can establish yourself here until you establish yourself in Africa. And I say all that to say, what you have here is tri trickle down economics. You don't own any of the primary economies. What you have in Africa is you have the opportunity to create uh, primary economies of which you can then benefit people I agree, here. 100%. So until, it's just like, for instance, uh, if, if, a, if the government of Ghana or the government of Nigeria want to come and interface with black Americans here, who are they speaking to? Are they speaking to Tariq's FBA? Are they speaking to he the Hebrew Israelites? Are they speaking to the NOI? Are they speaking to the Congressional Black Court, et cetera, et cetera? And until there is, th and this is what Cointelpro is about, is stopping you guys from being able to create your own black nation. Absolutely. So that you could then be economically powerful because you're, your, your spending power is 13th in the world. I mean, what is, <laughs> Africa's is like 1.1 trillion. That was in 2019. That's right. supposed to keep going. Ours is 1.6. I right. don't think black people realize that we have a higher spending power than the GDP of the continent of, of Africa, Africa right. who has more minerals and resources than any other place on the planet. Google has a bigger purchasing power than Nigeria. Yeah. Google, a startup company that started 30 years ago, has a bigger purchasing power than a country of 200 million people. I mean, shit, Apple has a bigger purchasing power than black people in America. <laughs> <Right>. So <laughs> corporations, is that's the power, right. right? That's why we, that's where it's like, one kudos you give to seeing the ability to create systems, right? Mm -hmm. It's like greatness is not based on morality, mm -hmm. but it's about the excelling at something, mm -hmm. right, at a high caliber. Mm -hmm. And what white American men have been able to do is create something considerably great in how they establish their systems mm -hmm. and powers of control, right? right? Now, the morality is missing because they're mm -hmm. morally bankrupt, but that is also part of their success, mm -hmm. is that capitalism has anything to do with morality or empathy or goodness, but it's about excelling mm -hmm. and productivity and profit, right. right? On the backs of whoever. And the secret of the entire world has always been the back of the darker skinned people, right. right? Our energy, our bodies, our language, our culture, our minds, all things that we generate from us, we are the generator of the world's mm -hmm. power. Mm -hmm. And without us, every economic system falls. Right. That's just the fact of the world. Peace, if you want to be an affiliate of Gold Water Corp, tap into 323-577-6692. Text affiliate to that number. See you on the other side of greatness. Peace. I want to talk about black women for a second. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can roll into a few other different things that I know you have going on that's dear to your heart in the projects. Mm -hmm. And that really uh, brings this whole conversation, you know, full spectrum. Right. Um, but you mentioned that in the system, you believe that black women should be at the top of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Now, I seen you post something about Queen and Zynga, I believe. Mm -hmm. And she had, I don't know, how many husbands did she have? 30, 50? I think it was 30. 30. You understand me? And I thought, <laughs> first of all, I thought it was interesting. Because, uh, you know, anytime you post something like that, the celebration in the comments of people who think that they could get anywhere near that is the funny part. But um, They can't even be someone's good side chick. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, right? Uh, that's, that's just, it's just amazing. But uh, <laughs> the one thing I had ended up looking up, I had stuff, so I said, let me study Queen and Zynga a little more, right? So first of all, she was successful in her campaigns, mm -hmm. right? She fought a war successfully for some time. Um, so as a, a, a military strategist um, and a leader for her people, she had success in that manner. Mm -hmm. Now, the way she treated her side pieces wasn't the best. Mm -hmm. You understand me? She killed some of them at the sex, mm -hmm. reportedly. Um, she made some of them um, stools. Mm -hmm. She made them fight in order to have sex with her that night. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and even slice one of, uh, on one report, slice one of the necks open in front of the enemies. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Really to show control and fear. Like, so as a leader, she was crazy, mm -hmm. but she was effective. And then in her later years, she ended up becoming cool with the Pope and going into more of a Christian route mm -hmm. and Christianizing her people for the relationship that she wanted to have to establish mm -hmm. peace. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to add that context because I know there's a movie coming out about her, I believe. 
which looks beautiful. But I say that to say this, when we glorify women in those positions, oftentimes they end up doing the same thing a man would do in those positions. Mm -hmm. So what is the logic behind having a woman at that hierarchy when historically we see when women get in those positions, they end up having to masculize themselves like those who were previously, mm -hmm. you understand me, in the positions before them to get the respect and or sometimes having to do it worse right. because they women. Um, I'm not necessarily speaking about contemporary or even medieval kind of renditions of what I believe uh, uh, maternal leadership looks like. I'm speaking about, there's a book that you can read called A Star of Deep Beginning by Charles Finch, MD. And in the book, it breaks down based on archaeology of um, mines in Congo, in Zambia, in uh, Swaziland, which is now called East Watini, yeah. and in uh, Zimbabwe, um, how we used to live in matrifocal, matriarchal, and matrilineal societies. And I'll break down all of the administration of those. Matrifocal means that the, the society is based on the family, right? Because you cannot separate a woman's work or a woman's labor from her family. Whereas with a man, we can do that. Like, I was in Somalia... Um, at five years ago doing a project and we were going to do a microfinance partnership with a bank there and they said that the best people to give the loans to, the microfinance loans to, these you know, one to five thousand dollar loans were women because for every, um, every uh, dollar a woman would reinvest 80 cents of that dollar back into her community and a man would only invest 40 cents of that mm. dollar back into his community. So is that community. like what Mohammed Yunus did with the banking system? Right, exactly. And um, with, within that, um, uh, kind of having this idea that the family is the first technology that existed and we need to focus on the family, not individual leaders, but collectively Key. what we're doing, right? And because of what patriarchy has now become, men often go off and say, hey, I'm going to do with this, with this with the world and everybody have to do the things that I want them to do, mm. right? And that causes all the problems that we see today. Um, with a matriarchal society, women now are not necessarily just in leadership positions economically, but they're in leadership positions spiritually, religiously, et cetera, et cetera. And all of the kind of hierarchical needs that humans decide that we need for ourselves, women are, at least if they're not at the top of those systems, they are in, in um, decision-making roles in those systems because i personally believe that if it's all man you can't do anything and mm. also if it's all woman you can't do Absolutely. anything i believe that in order to have that yin yang balance, i call it the god triarch right Not right patriarch and matriarch but god triarch the side by side rulership right or in 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 terms of like what the the holy trinity was supposed to be rather mm -hmm. than father son ghost it was supp supposed to be mother father child that was the holy trinity Absolutely. right and when you have a society that is, has been matriarchal, what we've seen throughout human history in many different cultures, uh, in what is now called Guinea, in the Napsaki, who were indigenous to North America, in the Guneyala people in Panama, when you have those systems of matriarchy, you have peace, right? Because women aren't going out there in, in their own volition, not trying to compete with men, but just in their own creation women aren't going out there trying to murder and destroy they're trying to create and then protect yeah, there are a lot less women serial killers than there are men right exactly and and um and then having a matrilineal society so one of the most in, one of the most respected indigenous communities in the world is called the guneyala people i've been there they're in panama and they own a basically a beautiful chain of islands and land in Panama where if you are female and you are of those people, you are able to own land. And that's it. The men can't own land. They have to marry into that land, mm. which makes it so that they will always be able to have the land administrated for the family first before tourism, before whatever man monument he wants to build a phallus somewhere, right? <laughs> and so, um, so I believe that Rather than looking at like contemporary or, or medieval 
organizations of women's power, we should start to look further back to what women were doing. For instance, Queen Hatshepsut, who, up, who united the upper and the lower Nile, uh, the upper and the, the lower kingdoms of, of Egypt, or should I say the lower and the upper, because the map was reversed, um, whereby she was the biggest military and economic ruler of the entire planet Earth, but she didn't say, do you know what it is? Let me get on boats and go and try and colonize China or, or go and try and colonize South America. Not that Egypt wasn't doing trade with them because, you know, Ramesses II, for instance, had traces of cocaine in his blood. You know, the coca leaf comes from mm -hmm. South America. There was already trade going on. And also, anything that I say, anybody, just Google it. Like, don't, don't listen to me, do your own research. But the, the fact of the So you said Queen... Oh, what, I, I, we, we talked about this. I think we went to her um, tomb just recently as mm -hmm. well. Akshepsha. We seen it uh, over air balloon when mm -hmm. we was out there. So you said she united the upper and lower crown. Mm -hmm. Now To create one country. Or one empire, should I say. Now, she wasn't supposed to become Pharaoh. How did it end up happening where she ended up getting a position? I forget how the story goes. I, my brethren, Axel is way better at telling that. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to even try and We're going to have it on another What I, what I studied is not how she got there, but her administration. Right. And the way that she was organizing the country. So, like, farming increased exponentially. Um, masonry increased exponentially. Uh, the schools, or we now call them the mystery temple systems, uh, the education then became accelerated because of what she was doing was saying, well, actually, you know, we need to rule the world and this is how it's going to be ruled. And what I believe is right now, personally, I would rather have four African, Afro-American indigenous women being the rulers of the world right now than four European men. Because at least then they're in my family for me to say, yo, what are you doing? If you, if you start doing horrible and brutal things. I think this idea that... Well, yeah, black women ver uh, uh, over white men any day. <laughs> right, of course, of course. <laughs> if, that's, if the choice is, it ain't, it ain't even a thought. Like. Of course, but also we don't want to have leaders, for instance, some of the dictators and leaders in Africa, uh, not saying that they're women, they are men, but some of the dictators and leaders in Africa are no better than the colonizers just because they've got a brown or black face. Like well, yeah, no, I think the dangerous thing about today's society is that you don't, you don't know their mind. I think more right. important than anything is like, even in American politics, you know, you'll vote for a woman because she's a woman, mm -hmm. not because you particularly agree with her stances, know her mm -hmm. history or her record. And that allows them to put anybody in position, right. you understand me, because of these new sensationalized movements. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, the... The important thing is to have a person that is actually for liberation of their people. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And not afraid to stand up in those positions. Because we now have a lot of black women in positions of power. and Useless. Now we have to see, <laughs> are you going to actually do something? Useless. You but, understand me? But they're just like, for but instance. But black men been in those positions too, to be fair, and they ain't did nothing either. Some. There were revolutionary leaders. They were killed, right? Oh, yeah. No, a lot. The, you know... Like, to that point, there's no great black man in this country specifically in our history that didn't have a black woman. Of course. You won't find a leader that didn't have a black woman. Of course. You know, even Frederick Douglass later remarried after his wife died, but he started with a black woman as right. an abolitionist. Right. And, you understand me? And, and I think that trying to reestablish, and this is the thing where we as black men need to have no fear, right? Yeah. We need to have no fear. If you believe in God, then everything is in God's plan and you should not be scared, right? And we need to have no fear so we can fiercely protect black women so that they are able to lead us to peace. Mm -hmm. And if we get to that position, rather than we all trying to become the black elite and trying to just be, you know, some other oppressors, right? We get to a place where actually we become liberators. That is then when we are able to rule the world again with a benevolent hand right now. A lot of the people who are in positions of power, for instance, the African leaders, most of the African leaders are sellouts. I don't believe in any of them. I don't trust in, trust in any of them because they are the black bourgeoisie. And a book that you can read uh, by Franz Fanon, you might have already read it, called A Wretched of the Earth, breaks down, which got made into a documentary which um, Queen Lauren Hill narrated called Concern and Violence. It speaks about him as a psychologist, speaks about the... Uh, 
the decolonization of Africa and how African leaders have just become the black bourgeoisie class, which aren't Absolutely. really a bourgeoisie class because they don't really have any of the entrepreneurial skills mm -mm. that it takes to be able to lead their country to economic prosperity. What they have became is just the agents for their clients in Europe. And that's why all this money is getting taken out of Africa and nothing is staying Yes, there. a lot of corruption. But, but to that point, though, um, and I want to just say this because... When I, when I think about history, history is selfish, right? Mm -hmm. History is going to put the man in front, but in every deliberation, those men always went back to that woman for counsel. Mm -hmm. So it was always a team effort in the leadership, but the man was always out front because mm -hmm. the woman, she's protecting the family mm -hmm. while the man is out there, you understand me, leading the revolution, if you will, being on the front line. But it was always, you know, a family unit. Mm -hmm. And... You may see Malcolm X out front, but Betty Shabazz was always there. You understand me? Um, you know, you may see Haley Selassie, but Queen Selassie was there too. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Same thing with Marcus Garvey. Same thing with Martin Luther King, Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Elijah Muhammad. Any of, like, great black men that have done something, mm -hmm. we just don't regard their queens as part of the team. Because but without them story, queens in that council... And that intellect and that wisdom that they was giving them, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have made it into those positions of power. And I think that history is just selfish in the way it always looks for one monument to prop up mm -hmm. rather than the team itself and or the family that is the team. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that once we look at history, reality, we've been working with our women to fight. We've mm -hmm. been working with our women to liberate. Mm -hmm. And I think. When we don't add that part of it into our story, mm -hmm. then it's easy to say that it's just been men out front. No, it's been men and women. Mm -hmm. You go to Black Panthers and 80% of them was women. Women, right. Right? So it, it, it's the same with any organization. There was a large amount of women doing the organizing, doing uh, all of the things that allowed that organization to flourish. So women mm -hmm. have always been a part of every movement, mm -hmm. but they've not particularly been the outspoken voices that are in front. Mm -hmm. You know, and to that point, and we can cover, you know, what you got going on in Congo, but what women do you believe have ideas mm -hmm. that you believe should be propagated where black men could get behind? And if they only had, you know, a stronger force behind them, then they would be great as leaders. Um, there's, there's many women. Um, one of my favorite teachers uh, is Asata Shakur. Mm. She's out there in Cuba now, and what she was doing within the Black Panthers was, was phenomenal. And as he said, 80% of that revolution was led by women who mm -hmm. are obviously leading and guiding the family. Um, in terms of actual leaders, uh, there's a, a, a woman called Dr. Africana, mm -hmm. I believe her name is, who was the U.S. ambassador for the African Union. And after a speech she made about the packed for the continuization of colonization. She was kicked out of that position. She's amazing. Um, one of the best leaders that is still a leader right now um, is uh, Honorable Mia Motley, who is the prime minister or who was the prime minister of Barbados. And I actually was part of a delegation that took her from Barbados to Ghana to create a bilateral trade agreement between Ghana and Barbados to remove Europeans from the conversation of what we people need to be doing for ourselves and how we need to be trading with each other. She then subsequently went on to go and create a office of the CARICOM, which is like the, Cari the, the, the community of the Caribbean nations in Nairobi. And of course it would have to be a, a black woman that's like, all oh, right, absolutely. I'm gonna go and you know, extend this olive branch of, of, of peace or extend this, um, this stool of peace and allow people to now go home and also from home bring things out to you know the former colony she was she's responsible for removing the queen of 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 uh, england as the head of state of barbados mm. like this is now jamaica's now getting into that but i believe that though as a leader and as a politician she has to do and say things to stay alive she also is very fierce and has a work ethic that is unbeknown to any i've been with her for a week where she has having each night three hours sleep and, and working the whole time. She's having meetings here. She's having Zoom meetings here. She's going to this thing. She's got, I'm just like, like the, the work ethic yeah. is so high that, that she's definitely one to look towards um, 
But I think, um, I think in terms of, of, of female leadership, I think we need to now return to creating systems that protect women, that allow, to, uh, allow us to be led in a, in, a, in a state of peace and higher intelligence and higher consciousness, right? And what I mean by that is if you have the average age in, in Africa being, you know, 19, right? You have, uh, you know, and there's 1.2 billion people in Africa. You have 600 million people in Africa right now who are young women, right? So you have all of these young women in Africa. You have all these young women in the USA. You have all these young women in the Caribbean. You have all of this potential, but what do we as men keep doing? We keep trying to control and we keep trying to mold that to fit a woman's place in an idea of a system that wasn't created by us or for us, right? And so when you actually allow women to lead and say, hey, what is it, is it that you want for the world? You see what they start doing, they create in these black woman owned vegan ethical using this fabric and using this sustainable material they're creating amazing shit because they're being able to lead themselves as the authors of their own destiny when we continue to say to them your place is in the kitchen right and all we're able to do is go out there and work for white people i don't think that that it should be that way i think yes you need to be able to provide for your family but at the same time you also what Provision is not just provision of, of, of uh, economic resources. Provision is care, intellect. Provision is knowledge. Provision is inspiration. How can I be in your spirit so that you can now be inspired and be useful on this planet, right? And so what I've got into now, so post Patrice Lumumba being killed by the CIA who paid a hundred and hundred thousand dollars or whatever to the governments of Belgium and the governments of France. Post him being killed, then what happened was a, a, a dictator was installed called Mobutu Sisi Seko, who was supported by the US government because he was their man, um, providing minerals for their weapons during the nuclear arms race when the USA was in, 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 in the Cold War. After he now left, or should I say, after he was now ousted, what happened was funded by the US again, was a war which is called the second. So when he wasn't backed up by the US government anymore, uh, the Congolese then basically said, now nah, he needs to get out. And that was called the first Congo civil war, where people basically rose up and said, now nah, he's out. The second civil war, say the, the civil war, was actually funded by the US government. And the, the main protagonists in that war are the US government, the governments of uh, uh, Belgium, France, the UK, China, Russia, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and a bunch of other countries. That is, the list is too long to name. But basically, that second war between 1998 and 2003 was responsible for the deaths of as much as 10 million people, right? Where people were being murdered, slaughtered, so that they could get access to the mineral deposits that now we use for our tech industry, right? And that is how data has been able to surpass oil through like genocide. And it's the biggest loss of life since World War II. And what happened to be able to do that is they destroyed women where now in Congo rape is and has been used as a weapon of war. And what happens is they go to villages and these are mercenaries and, and foreign multinational funded soldiers go to villages, they rape women, they rape kids, they chop up men and they basically disperse the village because if your wife is now raped, right, and you watched and you couldn't do anything about it, you can't look at her anymore, right? And now your whole family, your whole technology is destroyed, but what is left? The earth mm -hmm. and what is being used? Well, coltan, 60% uh, of the world's coltan, 60 to 70% of the world's coltan comes from Congo. That's what we need to make uh, CPU units, computer processing units that we now use in mobile phones. 70% uh, of the world's cobalt, which is used in lithium ion batteries, which is the green revolution of Musk. Like there is no fucking Silicon Valley without Congo being involved in that. And what has been done as much as the earth is being destroyed with these 24 trillion uh, 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 mineral, 24 trillion dollar value of mineral wealth resources in Congo, the women have been destroyed, where it is the highest rate of rape in the world. The rainforest is being destroyed and now it's Chinese mining corporations that are now 
uh, under contracts that have been given by the Congolese government, by the way, and this is what I mean about the black bourgeoisie and not all skin folk being kin folk, are now 70% of this, these minerals that are coming out of Congo and the rest is artisanal miners, which are basically like rural men and women who are digging, uh, digging into the earth, taking out coltan, taking out cobalt, taking it to Chinese mines, a sack of, uh, a, you know, a, a 30, 40 kg sack, I would say like 80 pound sack of, of coltan is worth $50 to them. Their annual GDP in Congo is $400. So you giving someone $40 for, you know, a week's work or whatever is like you paying their month month yeah. salary. That sack then gets uh, taken and manufactured in China, put into, um, uh, at, at, you know, a, a rate of what they're, they're, they're manufacturing it into is, is like uh, $20,000. So you got something that was $50,000, now you start putting it in 20 phones. Right, and you see, you see how it goes, right? And so that has been created. This is part of the underdevelopment. And it was actually Paul Kagame at the time who went to uh, Bill Clinton after the uh, Tutsi-led rebellion. So he led a rebellion against the inter who were uh, the genocideers who Burundi and Uganda was also involved in that was funded by the the US government and other governments because they knew that there was minerals there and they wanted to create instability. It's funny how there's always instability where minerals exist, right? Yeah, that's the instability that we ain't got <laughs> access. <laughs> right, instability and uh, national parks where it's just like they're holding these places, these, these, these parks in place where indigenous people are allowed access to these parks, right? But at the same time, um, the foreign multinational mining corporations are allowed access to these parks in the idea or the rhetoric that they're protecting the animals. So then why the fuck are animals always being poached and killed, right? We have to really look at what European colonialism has done to Africa. And what you were saying before about Africans and other groups, because, you know, 1865, Juneteenth was like the end of slavery in North America. Brazil was 1888. At the same time, in 1888 in Congo, 10 million people was, 15 million people was being killed, right? So they didn't have the economic power then. And I would say that probably one of the only countries that had, after slavery started, that had the economic power to be able to do anything for North Americans is Ethiopia. Maybe that's a conversation that y'all need to have with the, with, the, with the Ethiopian royal family, is like, what was you really doing at the time? Because um, you, you now have what has been created is a situation of, um, of massive instability in uh, East Central Africa, where these resources are being able to be taken with impunity, no taxes being paid, no human um, uh, rights, uh, uh, no human rights being adhered to. And then at the same time, whether it's in the 40s where the Manhattan Project is going on and they're building the nuclear weapons so that they can drop it on Nagasaki mm -hmm. and Hiroshima and these minerals are now being guided by the CIA all the way to uh, New York, these plutonium and uranium and all of the things that they need to make that. Um, or whether it's now, you know, 2022, where these minerals are being guided by, you know, Chinese government to China and then back to here, you have a system that is based on a dichotomy that is being created by the superpowers and it is leaving those people there in deficit. So I've been going to Congo now since I found out about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about the work you've been doing. And, and one thing, I, I don't know if it was, I think it was Congo where they recently said that they're not going to allow any outside miners to uh, basically, you know, mine the minerals there. Right. What, what was that situation? And then tell me, what do you have going on in the Congo? Because I know a brother such as yourself that is very well versed and educated um, where, you know, 99% of the world don't have this information, mm -hmm. right? Um, and information allows people to empathize, you know, mm -hmm. once they filter it through their consciousness and mm -hmm. they decide what morally is aligned with them or isn't. Mm -hmm. So I think that the exposure and awareness itself creates the change, mm -hmm. right? And then the people that actually go and do the work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's been happening recent in Congo? Um, well, I have kind of entered into Congo at the end of this kind of genocide where it's not really the end, but it's not as bad as it was. Um, and 
my position is I want to try to create as much sustainable, ethical and ecological systems as possible for the people there utilizing resources that I'm bringing from the West back to Congo because the systems that have been created there do not allow any inter-country or intercontinental trade to create sustainable ecosystems whereby people can you know, have money to be able to, or capital to be able to create a business and protect those businesses. So I have been caring for around, I say I, my organization, which is I Heart Africa. The reason why I called it I Heart Africa, which is a 501c3, though I don't believe Africa needs aid, I believe it needs trade, but it's just an intelligent way of me getting people to practice group economics. Um, I called it I Heart Africa because Congo, if you look on it geographically, if you look on a map, is the heart chakra of Africa, right? I love the name, actually, I Heart Africa. So it's like this, this carbon, melanin, mineral, whatever you want to call it, is what everybody is going to Africa for. Before they go in there for, like, just Earth, they're, they're going there for people, and then now they're getting those people to pull out Kotan, and cobalt, but coltan in particular, which is black, because this whole this whole Wakanda thing and the whole vibranium thing is literally just speaking about a superconductor, right? That's what vibranium was. It was a superconductor that was able to be manipulated into technologies and weapons and all of these things. Well, it's being manipulated into devices like cameras and phones and stuff, right? Because there is something that has this hyperconductivity about carbon, about blackness that is able to dark right. matter or dark energy that is able to be Store able to create energy this. very efficiently right exactly and you know as as you know when you wear something black it holds on to energy it holds mm. on to heat and where you wear something white it reflects it right Facts. and so i i have been uh, my organization has been caring for around 100 orphan children in congo for about six years and i started um, by boxing. So I used to be in the military. I was in the British military because I was young and dumb and I was in the trap and I wanted to get out of the trap. So I joined the military so I could get out of the trap. And then I started boxing in the military because there was white racists in the militaries that needed to get their jaws tested. And then after that, I then um, uh, I started a, a fitness movement in the UK, which is all calisthenics. Myself and I say I, as me and my friends, including my friend Coop, who's here with me today. We started a calisthenics movement, and then I sat down one day and I thought to myself, if I wasn't here tomorrow, they would be able to replace me with somebody else. So where am I going to be able to be irreplaceable and be able to fulfill out my destiny? And I was like, well, let me go to a place or places where there is underdevelopment so I can get into being a developer. And not an activist or any of that stuff, but actually... Because I activate people in the West, but I develop in Africa, right? And so I now, um, after doing a multitude of projects, including um, uh, uh, you know, boxing to raise money to be able to take care of children, so I put on charity boxing matches and uh, fought some people, raised some money through a crowdfunder, and then I used that to, to go to Congo and to start caring for children who didn't have enough to feed themselves yeah, and, I saw it. and that type of stuff. I then went from there to doing a, uh, an agricultural development project in Somalia, which at the time was the biggest crowd funder in human history uh, in terms of uh, using a digital interface platform, media platform. Um, and, you know, we raised like three million dollars in like a week or something crazy. It was crazy. And um, I went to Somalia and, and as well as actually feeding people who were facing a drought, but I actually took a percentage of that money and, and got 100 irrigation engines to people to be able to turn a semi-arid uh, uh, land into like jungle. So I, I, I was able to help people, working with the uh, Ministry of Agriculture in Somalia, mm -hmm. help the farmers there to turn an area that was arid into, or semi-arid, into an area where they were growing watermelons and like uh, eggplant and all of these things, uh, tomatoes. And then after that, I started to um, build a school in Ghana, which is completed now in a place called Akasombo um, with a few of my friends uh, on a project called We Will Rise Together, including uh, Luo Deng, Fuse ODG, Steph London and, and uh, uh, Lenny Kravitz and a bunch of cool people. And I also started to refurbish the Haile Selassie High School in Kingston, Jamaica, because that, that is the real story of 
Black Panther and Wakanda, where a man, a king, an emperor, came out of Africa, went, to around, went around the world to different uh, groups of melanated people, took with him gold, gold bars. It was four gold bars that he took. And he used it to buy an area of land that he originally intended for a university. But the government of Jamaica at the time, I think Tavares is his name, stole a lot of that money. But they had a school built. Nothing was done in that school since 1971 in terms of like actually building infrastructure and building out proper facilities in that school. So I started refurbishing that school with the same uh, We Will Rise Together movement um, with a brother called uh, Jesse Royal. Andre Gray, uh, a sister called uh, Cleopatra, who's um, XXX Tentacion's mother, and just mm -hmm. Lenny Kravitz, a bunch of people. I was just like, yo, we gotta do this. And people were just like, all right, cool, we gotta do this, right? And that's the activation bit. But then the actual developer is like me being in Jamaica every single day in the ghetto, making sure that the construction team is happy, the right materials are being sourced, and it's documented and relayed to the people in a way whereby we can continue the legacy of great people or great ideas where African kings came and said, hey, we want to be part of like this, this, this global story as well. And yeah. then um, uh, Jamaicans loved Haley Selassie. I know one racist. story when I was in uh, Jamaica, they said that there was a drought before he came. Right. And then and when he landed, his rival, it rained. It rained and they treated him like a god ever since. Which is interesting because I was raised Rasta, but it was like Haile Selassie was Christian. He worshipped Jesus. But they seen him as the second coming of Jesus Christ or the coming of Jesus Christ, which semantics. I'm not even going to go into all of that stuff. But Yeah, it was I, the Holy Priest Emmanuel, um, Haile Selassie and Marcus Garvey was the Holy Trinity when I went out there. Right, right, right. And then, you know, Selassie is, is supposed to be the unification of the... The, the, the lineage of King Solomon and, and um, all that stuff. Anyway, um, so where I am at now with Congo is I've been supporting uh, two orphanages for a number of years now, but in, on the 22nd of May last year, so it's nearly been a whole year since this happened, um, there was a volcano eruption. So are you familiar with the Ring of Fire? No. Okay, so the Ring of Fire, basically the Congo sits on what is called the East African Rift Valley. This is a literal split of the earth all the way from Mozambique all the way up to Israel. Jerusalem mm. in Israel in particular, right? Out of this comes the Nile, the Great Lakes, the Ring of Fire, right? And out of this comes all of the, um, all of the minerals that we now need for all of this tech and all of that that kind of tech industry comes from there, including gold, diamonds, and all of this stuff, comes out of this, uh, the, the most, one of the most valuable gems in the world is called Tanzanite, right? Comes out of Tanzania, sits in the same rift, right? And the Ring of Fire is in an area called Goma, where you have, in, in very close proximity, eight volcanoes, five of them active. And the Mount Nairagongo is the largest lava lake in the world and the most active volcano in the world, right? This is where I'm building, right? Okay. Just down the road from there. Yeah. I've seen it on your Instagram where you show where the lava flow had devastated the homes of the people and left mm -hmm. them displaced and right. it's still existing today. Right, and so it erupted on the 22nd of May and it displaced 100,000 people. When there's a natural disaster in, in Europe, we hear about it. When there is a, a natural disaster in North America, we hear about it. Not only do we hear about it, but the white world comes together and organizes its resources to be able to be a cyst or an assister for those people. And we call that aid. When there is a natural disaster in Africa, it'd be like, fuck them Negroes. Whatever happens, it might be, it might be spoken about for a week. And after that, you don't hear about it again. You have not seen any media, apart from on my Instagram, you have not seen any media about what is happening to those people right now, a year on from that. They're living in tents uh, right now still to this very day. There's 25,000 people displaced. And uh, last year we did a crowdfunding, we raised some money and we built four houses and we adopted 22 children, as in my organization, adopted 22 children. Since then we've crowdfunded for, um, I would say we've crowdfunded for about six months, like hard. We've raised nearly half a million dollars. And out of that we are building, currently we are building um, 30 homes 
and we are also going to create a microfinance uh, project because when you have all these people who've been displaced, remember, all their stuff's been burnt. They don't have anything, right? So when, they, when you replace them or you rehouse them, it's like, well, they need businesses, they need mm -hmm. loans, they need all the stuff that we would need access to, to to be able to develop, right? And so we have created a microfinance um, initiative where people in these camps can now come to us for loans and then we can help them to start their basket making business, their soap business, their, you know, their motorbike garage for fixing, you know, the motorbikes that they use to get up and down the roads, etc. So that not only are we building a village, but we're also able to microfinance that so that it can have economic prosperity and they can create their own businesses and intra uh, community trade as well as um, we are creating uh, an agricultural project where we are growing high value, um, I say we are growing, we are beginning to grow high value crops, including chia seeds. Uh, you know, everybody loves chia seeds in their smoothies and stuff. Mm -hmm. We are growing chia seeds, sesame. Everybody loves hummus and everybody forgets that hummus is African. As much as it's Lebanese, without the sesame seed, there is no hummus, right? Mm. And that's African. Well, yeah, I mean, because normally you go to like Middle Eastern places and they got the hummus, that's why. Man. You understand me? So it's not, They got you that know, from trading Africans. You go connected to wherever you got it from. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, no, I get that, but hummus is just a garbanzo bean or the chickpea that's been mixed with sesame paste, which is grown in Africa. It's be hitting, I ain't gonna lie with It's be hitting, I be eating that every day. <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we be eating hummus. Man, speaking of, you know, you, you became infamous for mm -hmm. eating food on the ground, specifically mm -hmm. fruits. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And these fruits have allowed you to really tap into the feminine persuasion. You understand? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody know mess. You understand me? With the, with the watermelon naked on the ground, fruit thirst trapping. How did that start off? Because I know the people go ask me, you got to ask them about the fruit. Um. And when did you go vegan? I had a brother on here by the name of Yaki and and we really, and it's a lot of reason I asked you about a lot of the, the health questions because the last episode we did was just amazing. The brother mm -hmm. did an amazing job about the importance of fruit, mm -hmm. electrical foods, alkaline foods, and the whole nine. And so we went deep into that whole cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, where did the shirt off watermelon uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> shocker man start? And where did you transition from, you know, uh, you know being vegan um, and turning that into a lifestyle and, and figuring out where that was also something that you can utilize to market and teach others about. I was raised Rasta and I was raised plant-based. I was raised vegan. So my mama got that to me first because we didn't believe that we were supposed to eat anything in our diet that contained suffering so that our life could, could have life. Mm. It wasn't even called a diet, it was called a liberty. Yeah, liberty. Rather, there's no diet in yeah, it. Yeah, that's what we're talking right? about, live it. Right, and so, um, and I thought I made that up. I ain't gonna lie. No, no, that's I thought Rasta. I made that up on my own. I was like, you know, I ain't gonna say a die. It got to be a livid. I was like, okay. And then I heard other people say it. I'm like, they stole it from me. No, I mean, me, but... the, f the first time I ever heard of it was when we called Ito Foods, which is Vital yeah, Foods, Ito. right? And um, I really went off the path. My grandma started feeding me meat when when we moved in with my grandma, and um, then. I returned to that. So the consciousness was there, but I wasn't allowing myself to access it because of me being involved in the pitfalls of society, right? And um, I, I went to, what happened, there was a chain of events, what happened? Um, my, one of my friends was murdered. Part, part of the reason why I do the calisthenics that I do in the way that I do it was because I used to train with a man called Gavin. And Gavin was killed by some Pakistani man who just had it in for him for a variety of reasons. Um, and he, this brother was my height. And you know I ain't tall, like I'm 5'7", right? Mm. Conservative 5'7", liberal 5'8", <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but but, but um, he was my height and he could do reps, and I'm not lying, right? God's honest truth. He could do reps with two 40-pound uh, 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 vests on. Mm. Um, he could do reps of 20, and he could do 200 pull-ups, right? In sets of uh, 20 to 30, until it was done, mm. right? With one minute rest in between. 
Not mm. many men can do that on earth, right? If you put, I'm going to try it. You, you should. You should try I'm, it. I'm taller, so it's definitely going to be harder, but I'm going to try it. 80 pounds, sets of 20, 200 pull-ups. That's your workout, right? 200 pull-ups, only one minute rest time. Right, I'm why? Gonna, I'm going to have to build up to it, but I'm going to do it. Shirt off video. Uh, <laughs> and it's going to be sponsored by fruits. Right, right, right. right. Fruits and so, fruits. A little swimmer's not working, not feeling like a man. Testosterone not pumping. Stamina in the gym ain't going hard enough. Not exerting maximum effort and energy and endurance when you inside there. Recovery time taking too long. Not feeling like your immune system is strong. Energy is not overreacting. Brain doesn't feel stimulated throughout the day. Well, if you're having any of those problems, it's okay. You come over here and you try the sports moss. It's especially formulated with all natural ingredients, such as sea moss, zinc, elderberry, vitamin D, and cordyceps which is a very powerful mushroom fungus that allows you to be able to tap in to self. If you want to do your own research, please do, but I've done a ton of research and I can tell you it works. There's magic in these pills right here, but more than that, there's nature in these pills. And once you tap back into your nature, you tap back into that manhood. Peace, family. Get on the sports moss. So he was training like I had never seen anybody train before in my life, right? Him and one of my elders called Bubba. And we was training together in the park. Unfortunately, um, may he rest in peace, he was murdered by some evil people that I helped to get convicted and locked up. But after that had happened, um, I then uh, got a, a park built in his memory, like a, a calisthenics park built in his memory. And when I seen the park built, because I designed it and then I submitted it to Leeds City Council and, and where I used to live in the UK, I submitted it to Leeds City Council. They basically got the designs because I wanted to dedicate it to him. They got the designs and then they made it like a Leeds City Council thing and not a, a tribute to him mm. because they didn't want to create a, a confliction between the, the, polari the polarized Caribbean and, 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 and Asian communities there. So they just took my stuff made it into what they wanted, it's still there to this day, made it into what they wanted to make it into. And I saw this, this after he was murdered, I, I hadn't cried, I hadn't grieved or anything. I just went for a year. I just went to London and started my workouts with all the man them. And I saw this stuff, and at the time, I was with um, two of my close friends, three of my close friends, and um, they were like, what you would consider alpha males, like we don't speak about emotions, we're just like hard and like, you know, men have got bodies on them yeah, and these yeah, type yeah. of men, right? And um, I saw the, the equipment in the park and I wanted to cry. And I, could, I didn't feel comfortable enough to cry in front of them man there. So what I did is I went on the equipment and I didn't warm up and I just went crazy until something broke and I ripped my pec muscle off my chest. When I ripped my pec muscle off my chest, a week after that I went to Kemet. And I was there at the foot of the, the pyramids and I was like, oh shit. They really built this mm -hmm. and it's still here to this day. What am I going to do? Build a park? Like, what, like mm. what, am I, what, what is going to I mean? really, I had this, I did a video. I asked people, you know, you go to Kemet and you see the legacy of what they left behind. Mm -hmm. And then it does make you have that question like, damn, what would I leave behind that future people can marvel at? Right. You understand so me? That was the beginning of me now saying, do you know what? After doing research, these people weren't eating these people weren't eating chicken every day. These people weren't eating fried food. There was never, as uh, uh, Honorable Dr. Laila or Layla Africa said, there was never, never a, a, a frying pan found in a tomb, right? So these people are at the highest of high vibration. There's no GMO. There's yeah. nothing in their, in, their, in their nutritional program to be able to distract them from what they came to earth to do. So I became a nutritionist. So... When I was a nutritionist and I used to do nutritional consultations and that's how I'd make my money, um, I realized that most people in the hood, they were not interested, not one iota care, apart from like a few groups, didn't, the mass of people in the hood did not care about the health benefits of fruits. 
They didn't care. I could tell them, you know, the beta carotene found in a mame is better than that in a carrot. And I could tell them, you know, that uh, in, in, in soursop is, is abundant in all of these things that allow you to, you know, reduce your rates. Of I could tell them all of this stuff, right? And they would look at me and they would be like, yeah, but that KFC advert though. Oh, my mama. I mean, you know, when we went to <laughs> Miami, we were passing out the fruits. You had to be a salesman and give somebody something for free. Right. That's good for them. And they hungry. Right. Look dry as hell. Yeah, what's that? Yeah. Well, I don't I know ain't about a burger. that. I don't eat that, brother. Right. You know I, what don't, I'm I don't know about all that. Yeah. Bring them a shot yeah. in their arm with some good marketing or bring them something fried and they'll be No, get bring down. some chicken bits, some church, some churches, some Kentucky fries. Man, come on, man. You right. got a customer look, look for at, life. Look at, um, People fighting over Popeyes. Yeah. That was one of the biggest marketing campaigns that black people had ever done for a, a, a European, unpaid for a European. During the middle of a health pandemic, too. Right, exactly. So, uh, or going into a health pandemic. And same thing when they utilize Krispy Kreme as ways to get people to sign up for the vaccine and the shot. Krispy Crack. And, 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 and I was like, how do I get people, my people, who, as... Um, Khalid Mohammed said, we ain't just educators, we're entertainers and educators. That's a fact. We're edutainers, yeah. right? So you gotta be so, inspirational so and educational. So I gotta be that. So I'm like, how do I get people to eat fruit? Because when I first started, yeah, <laughs> hey, this was a, fruit. This was a magnificent long story right, that wraps right, around right. to how he honorably, right. you understand me, start taking off his shirt for the fruit. Right, because don't, don't, the people out there, like <laughs> I, I, seen, I seen a lot of men at the time who were insecure and they, they were, they were trying to emasculate me. They were trying to say all kinds of stuff because they were insecure because their <laughs> girls was in my DMs. Yeah. And I wasn't responding to them <laughs> unless I was like, do you want a box of fruit? Help yeah. me sell the fruit. Imagine this. I created a multi-million dollar company and a multi-million dollar marketing campaign that I never paid any money for, right? That's game right there. I used a platform that I didn't create, made on devices that was created from... Uh, the backs of the people in Congo to be able to now uh, re, re, um, re-educate people in the way that they look at fruit. A lot of people before me, and I'm not, my ego is not big. So I'm not like, yo, I am, you know, the Alpha and the Omega, Dr. Aris Latam, Dr. Laila Africa, Dr. Sebi, a bunch of people have come before and said, Rastafari has become before and said, you need to eat natural foods that grow from the ground, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Marcus Garvey, Elijah Mahatma, so many people have said, you need to eat right, right? Because that's the way that you get your mind right. You can't get your mind right till you get what you're eating right, right? But I was like, how do I do it? And like get it to people who's on TikTok and who's on... You did it in a way, I think that like you are correlated with fruit. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like People come up to me to, to this day and say, oh, the fruit man. Yeah, I'm I think like- <laughs> that that's, it, it's to, as a marketing campaign, and, and now as I'm thinking about it, when it comes to health and fruit, like you are now directly correlated with those things. Mm-hmm. So it was definitely successful in what the campaign was for. And there was a lot of people who definitely tried fruit after that. Mm-hmm. You understand me? And sometimes for the first time in a long time, especially mm-hmm. the exotic fruits. Mm-hmm. And I think that that was probably more of the appeal is that the hell is that? Like right. you're getting educated right. upon all of these different type of fruits, the cacao and the breadfruit. And the, you know, me, I was going to, when I went to Jamaica, that's when I was learning about all of them, the aki and eating all of them good ass fruits. But how did you feel when you ate them? Oh man, that's How did you feel, it. like your melanin, how did you feel in your Well, temple? you know, it's vibrational, so it's electric, it's anti-gravity. So mm-hmm. you go stand up, you got a lot of energy, you feel mm-hmm. light. You're mm-hmm. like, I'm about to do a fruit, live it right now, where, you know, I'm gonna try to go through 30 days with just fruit. Mm-hmm. You know, and the, the problem is sourcing the right fruit. Mm-hmm. That's the issue. I mm-hmm. need seeded fruit. I need fruit that's actually good for me. Otherwise, I'm eating fruit, but it's chemicalized mm-hmm. and it doesn't actually have a power fertilization because mm-hmm. it don't have, um, you know, uh, the ability to reproduce itself. Mm-hmm. So it's hard nowadays, but I also know that it's better to eat mm-hmm. fruit than it is to eat the junk. Right. Right. It's kind of like a person complaining about like, eating powdered minerals when they don't eat no minerals. Right, it's right. It's like, it's still better for you. It may not be the best intake you go right. get, but the opposite is that you eat none. Right. So like for me, eating some is better than none. Right. And whatever intake until you can get to the point where you're eating completely organic mm-hmm. is best. Right. You know, are you still running an operation? 
Um, right now, I've shelved it because the actual company, where it was, and the people that I was partnered with were not interested in getting, they were not interested in eliminating food deserts, let's put it mm. that way. So the fruit, I don't know if you ever saw the price of the fruit, but for me, it was too expensive, right? Exotic fruit, as it's been called, is not exotic fruit, it's just tropical fruit. And we are tropical people because we have tropically adapted skeletons. So when we want to eat fruit that's compatible with our genotypes, that's why I was asking you how you felt. When I'm eating the fruit in the videos, right, and I'm bearing in mind I'm on my own in Thailand. It's right? like you're getting a serotonin boost. Right, so you're eating that fruit and you're high, right? You're high vibrational, you're happy. So people think, oh, he's eating this shit, he's exaggerating. And yeah, I might put on the shea butter and whatever because people are on this, <laughs> on, this, on, this, on this low vibration. But it's no different to what, you know, music videos are doing right now yeah. to get people to buy into funny, Audi bro. or say yeah. Audi. Maybach, right? Yeah. It's no different to that, but I'm doing it for when you buy into what I'm selling, I'm now using those funds to, to like take care of kids and put them from school and stuff. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, you, I just look at things purely for what they are. Mm -hmm. So I see marketing as marketing. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Uh, I see a successful campaign as a successful campaign. I just wanted to ask more so for the people. I know that's one of the things <laughs> that you're known for. Uh, uh, so also one of the things you're known for is the ladies. You understand me? Now, don't get me wrong. You know, you, you married and you're not entangled up into none of these things. Mm -hmm. But I remember during a point in time you were saying you was going through a point of no sex, semen mm -hmm. retention, whatever it may have been. But you was around all of the gorgeous, mm -hmm. you understand me, voluptuous, mm -hmm. melanated, glazing, the beautiful <laughs> Amazonian, you understand me, uh, prime species on this planet Earth. <laughs> so brothers was like, it's no way that, this, <laughs> that man's is telling the truth about not... You know, uh, having sex. Right. Um, so how did you maintain the discipline while being around, you know, these optimal species of goddesses? <laughs> You're doing a marketing campaign for the women, I know. Um, look, Maybe I've we could had... flash them on across the screen. They know what I mean. <laughs> they're my friends. And the thing yeah. is, is like, we are electrical, men and women are magnetic. So men are drawn to women and at the same Absolutely. time we are, are, are an abundance of energy. Women are stronger than us because it is the person who can take the punch or the person who can gather the energy and hold it is stronger than the person who gives it out. Mm. Right? And that's our balance, right? And we need that. And what I believe is that as with fruits and roots, there needs to be a or indigenous or I Heart Africa, there always needs to be a, a foundational basis for why and how you do things. So it needs to be grounded, right? The problem is that we are so tapped into our root chakra that we are continuously discharging our energy rather than anchoring through our root and then allowing all of that energy to come up to our crown chakra, Thanks. right? So instead of having like this direct connection with the subconscious, superconscious, and through our conscious being, we have this subconscious, conscious, and superconscious connection. All we have is this discharging of energy. That's and this fact. is what ejaculation is. It's just a consistent discharging of energy where we're not able to tap into our God state, right? That's a fact. Because God is procreation and regeneration, it's not recreation, right? This recreational nonsense that we've been tapped into through recreational activity is allowing us to recreate white capitalism, right? And rather than recreate, sorry, rather than create or procreate our nation, uh, our highest vibration, we are just consistently trying to give ourselves prostate cancer. And I had, you know, I've had everything that I wanted to do with women I've done, right? back in the day. Ask anybody about me in the hood with the, with the, just, it's done, right? It's been done. So by the time I got to where I am now in a relationship, and I'm not married, but I have a partner, and I'm not interested in, in other women sexually, is because I know that actually sexual energy is just one echelon of energy. And if you can actually hold on to your sexual energy, there's right. loads of different energy portals that you are allowed access to. So. The longest I didn't have sex for was like for seven months when I was in Iraq, but then also for seven months during this pandemic when I was in Thailand. I didn't have sex for seven months then. And the last person that I'd had sex with uh, was the woman that I'm with now. But that wasn't even anything to do with her. That was to do with me saying, actually, 
how am I going to make sure that I am able to stay sane in this time mm. and create this highest vibration of energy? So, so did you have access to her or was it also the fact that you didn't have access as well? I wasn't with her then. I had access to other women. There was, you know, Ethiopia. There was beautiful oh, women there. you had a there. plethora. They're, they're there. Said. They're there, yeah. right? But the thing is about women is a lot of the time, though you might, now social media is a bit of a weird space. You might have had women try and force their sexual energy on you. Oh, yeah. No. Right? Yeah, no, but, that, that, that happens. But Gem, it's not rapey though. Like with women, it's not like, yo, do you know what it is? I am going to now, as a culture, as a culture of women, that's what it's going to be. So well, that's I don't know. Like, nowadays, women are aggressive. I just think that... But that's not their the, culture, though. The phallus symbol is weaponized because it's, you know, it's, 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 it's seen as something that could be used in an attack, right? Mm -hmm. And the vagina is not. So the, it's definitely not a woman's culture, but women are more masculized today mm -hmm. to where they're definitely aggressive, specifically on social media, where if a man does the exact same thing, mm -hmm. it's definitely seen in a different light. Mm -hmm. um, and so also I think that it robs a lot of women of accountability or when they are being like that. Mm -hmm. Because women have never been shown to be villains in a sexual manner mm -hmm. when a lot of young boys got they start with older women. Right. You understand me? Like women are often, <laughs> and, and I love women and I love y'all, but you know, women, there's a lot of women predators oh, that grow, but the society is more normalized for women to be predators. And then mm -hmm. just the idea, I mean, it's a, that's a longer conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, because once you get into how all of these things fit into and how we got here, mm -hmm. you can unfold and understand why. But um, <clears throat> I was saying that to the point of, you know, semen retention is definitely powerful. Mm -hmm. One of the bigger issues that we have in society today, and this is something that I think any man struggles with, especially in today's time with social media, mm -hmm. is the amount of energy and focus you give towards sexual attention, mm -hmm. right? And, and so sexual retention, is powerful just in the sense that being able to control that energy, mm -hmm. which is an energy that can control you, mm -hmm. allows you to have more power and discipline over self. Mm -hmm. And that conjuring of that power is also the conjuring of willpower. Mm -hmm. You know, sustaining that life energy, utilizing it for ideas, utilizing it for a continuity of thought, mm -hmm. right? It's like, we talk about fecundity in the body, but fecundity in the mind is the production of ideas. Mm -hmm. Fecundity in the, in the body is about the, the sperm. DNA. But when you, you know, have sex with a woman, you ejaculate, that's like 30 miles per hour of energy shooting out your body. All mm -hmm. that energy is gone, and all of that chi and that chi and that ka energy that you built up now releases, mm -hmm. right? So, like, you've built up enough energy life force to create a world, to create a child, but it goes outward to nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's not reused and recycled for creative energy, mm -hmm. for willful energy, for manifesting energy, mm -hmm. right? Like if I was to, the, the, the advice of like, sex is a conjuring act, mm -hmm. like you're gonna produce something from it, mm -hmm. right? Oftentimes it's a life, mm -hmm. right? But you can also produce the babies of ideas, mm -hmm. right? Where there's visions you can have and you can put energy towards that. So there was the conversation of retaining the ejaculation and disconnecting that from, you know, uh, uh, orgasm for men. Mm -hmm. Number one, like if men were to talk about polygamy, they would have to have more sexual control over that orgasmic process anyway to satisfy multiple women, mm -hmm. which is why the conversation is laughable a lot of times because a lot of men physically wouldn't be able to handle it. You would be, and if you was, you would literally be draining yourself and killing yourself earlier and earlier, because after sex, a man's body has to replenish the amount of semen that he lo loses. And I mean, that we conversation do when, isn't, it's, when he's hoes out. Like, we do that <laughs> yeah. every time we go to the club. But we get tired right after sex because our body has to replenish this substance that mm -hmm. creates life. So, like, our body goes through a whole process. Instead of our body having to do that, imagine if it still went back to the faculties of thinking and restoring life and focus on other areas so that we literally can, you know, have sex into an early grave. Mm -hmm. You know, and learning to reconstruct the mind and the sexual discipline prowess, you know, is something that you're going, especially in a world that's over-sexualized in mm -hmm. every aspect of it. And it's something that the black man and woman and really people all around the world have to mm -hmm. get a hold of. Um, because where some people see the undisciplined sexual activity of sexual liberation, mm -hmm. right? And then others see it as chaos mm -hmm. and being controlled by the force itself. Mm -hmm. So I've had conversations with women around the world and 
some of these women, like I said, they see the not controlling their sexual urges or any of those things as just complete liberation and true freedom, mm -hmm. right? And I think that the perspective is the issue that we have because in the overindulgence of the urges is where you have the undiscipline for the building. Right. Right, because we'll put more focus into that area down here rather than up here. Right. Right, and here's where we build from. Mm -hmm. Here's where we grow from. This energy is where we pull from to create that mm -hmm. which we have in here, but it has to be powered up. Right. So we are walking around empty vessels. Discharging. Discharged consistently. So controlling that aspect, and it's something that you know I deal with and I know that any man deals with. Mm -hmm. It's a consistent thing that you strive to have power over. Mm -hmm. Because right now, you know, beautiful, voluptuous, you know, woman can walk in the room, you know, just, just amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's going to divert some attention. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by nature, like you say, we're going to be electrically attracted. Mm -hmm. But what makes the difference between the one who has control? Mm -hmm. That's the man that has power. That's the man that is godly. Discipline. That's the discipline. You cannot be one of, of, of the disciples of God if you have no discipline. And women love that. Right. That's one thing. I'm like, well, Shaka's around all these women. If he's not having sex, it's going to attract more women to come too. Don't don't get. I'm I'm pretty sure. I might have used to sex again in my life. I'm not saying like I'm some kind of holier than holy. <laughs> I might do it in my life. I don't know what's gonna be going on in my life. But what I do know uh, is is no. I was just saying the point of when you're around women, and it's just game for men. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're around women and you don't want to have sex with them, it makes them more attracted to you. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Uh, women want to be desired. Mm -hmm. So knowing that there's a limit that you will go with them is only going to make them further. Mm -hmm. You understand me? want to tap in with you. So I imagine in the circles that you are with, when you put out there, I'm not having sex, number one, a woman's going to feel safe, mm -hmm. right? You're not weaponizing the friendship or relationship mm -hmm. in a manner to where you're trying to get to that goal. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to make more women want to come around and more women want to come around. And now you reverse the attraction of you putting all your desirable energy out there trying to get them to, they put their energy to come around a man like you. Well, more... Mm. I said, a more game, I would say we are all women until we're six weeks old. That's why we have nipples and that's why we have uh, uh, testicles that just throw back ovaries. They drop down and they fall. Well, you wouldn't be a woman. A woman would be, you know, that developmental. Right. But you'll be in between that, you know, period of adding that chromosome onto yourself. Right. Which but, is but, just development. But we are, we are essentially. What I was, what I was, my point is, is that we are essentially a feminine energy. We came through our mothers mm -hmm. and we are essentially now as men, we are a balance. If we are full men, we are a balance of masculine and feminine energy. If you're just 100% masculine, then you're only half a man. And you'll find that out when you have a daughter or you take care of little girls. You'll find out that actually you all being hard all the time is not your, is, is not your highest calling right yeah, actually that's machismo that's not real like masculine even testosterone i was talking about this with michael she earlier that you know what testosterone does in the body you know it just not charges you up to be over masculine in that sense but you know it helps produce that will it makes you love working hard you mm -hmm. understand me like it's so many different driving forces mm -hmm. that we have and like masculine energy was never supposed to be about brute force and conquering mm -hmm. that is what we see through Europeans a right. lot. Um, and so we establish that connection as what's typical in the trace of what's masculine. And, and, and Arabs, because one thing that happens because of the narrative that's been di dictated now for a while is that Arabs get off the hook from their, what created the golden age of Islam was the brutal enslavement of West, Central and East Africans. Without that, there would have been no so what everybody can research is in 869, there was a rebellion called the Zand Rebellion, which basically means the nigger rebellion, right? Where in Baghdad at the time, Baghdad or Basra at the time, but in Iraq, basically, there were so many enslaved Africans there that they overthrew the government and became the government for 14 years, right? That was called the Zand Rebellion. And um, this kind of, this Judo-Christian, -Christ Abrahamic, Knights Templar, Westphalian, Germanic system of rule and control that has been manipulated for lower vibrational purposes for some groups on earth. Because like, let's be honest, for instance, the nation of Islam. The nation of Islam ain't oppressing Africans in Africa, right? 
it is the Arabs in Saudi Arabia that are oppressing Africans in Africa, right? So there's different ways to use religion in, in Sudan. Some of the greatest uh, revolutions that ever happened were Christian-led, but led by black Africans. Yeah, well, you know, the way we was taught Islam, like, even when I talk about, like, nobody coming for black people in America, mm -hmm. you would have to look at, you know, of course, Marcus Garvey, you got Noble Drew Ali and the Nation of Islam, like, coming for black people in America mm -hmm. to teach them and to liberate them out of their oppression, right? Mm -hmm. By giving them knowledge itself, giving them systems to civilize them mm -hmm. under some rule and construct to be respected for the rest of the world, right? And so the thing about the nation Islam, like once you grow up in it, the conversation was Islam is mathematics, that we don't follow an Arab template, which is why a lot of Arab Muslims didn't like the nation of Islam mm -hmm. and to this day don't like it. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if we did, then we would grow these large beards and we would wrap our heads and we would take on an Arab culture, mm -hmm. right? Which would have nothing to do with Islam itself. And the mm -hmm. ideas that I was taught about was that Islam came from just the original way of life and practice of people, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you would connect it to like the Ma'at laws, mm -hmm. right? You would connect it to any practicing of original people that is naturally instinctively in them, mm -hmm. right? And this is one way or form that you can get close and back to being a righteous people commanding themselves. Mm -hmm. So it was never about any worshiping or really for me personally, I can only really speak on my experience in the way that I gathered it, never anything about to do with Arabs. Mm -hmm. You understand me? at all because Arab, like Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was taught by the angel Jabril who was an original man, mm -hmm. a dark-skinned black mm -hmm. man. So for me, this is a black man teaching you, giving but you game. But that's here though. In Africa, it's all to do with, with Arabs. And well, like, yeah, I mean, Mecca, in Africa, that whole the thing. Arabs, the white Jesus, they mind so, and you know, I love my, my, my brothers in all across no, no, the no, diaspora, no. but we Reli gotta keep religion, it real. Religion in Africa is mad. Like, no, no I mad. remember when I went there and, you know, you know, you got the, the voodoo, you got the voodoo Christians, you understand me? You got the Jesus Christians. You got so many different types, but mm -hmm. also so many leaders sold out their people to the Pope, mm -hmm. right? And to Britain and to these organizations so that they could have peace. Mm -hmm. So like they, they, they traded, right? Mm -hmm. Their spirituality for prosperity in mm -hmm. times of peace, mm -hmm. right? And that was really a cheap way to lead. So instead of saying that, we're going to continue to go to war and fight. He said, we can't fight and beat these people. So instead, the trade-off would be, I will bring my people under their cross, mm -hmm. you understand me, and their God, and a byproduct is they will allow my legacy to lead out in peace and my peoples get to live in peace. You know who funded that? Before the, uh, you heard of the, the, the El Dorado, the gold road, right? Mm -hmm. Before the Portuguese and uh, got all that gold from South America, do you know who funded that first? Who that? Ethiopians. Mm. They were selling their gold to the Knights Templar. They funded the Vatican first, and that's sort of conversation that nobody wants to have. Well, I gotta. I'm knowing the Ethiopians. They go come. They go have something to say. So I got to bring some Ethiopian scholar on here next. Yeah, now. no, no, bring them because yeah. all of the churches that got built, and like I, you can go to the center of Ethiopia right now, and there's there's the, like right in Bole in an area called Bole. There's a statue of white Jesus. Yeah. So it's like whether you're in Rio de Janeiro or whether you're in Ethiopia, which is an uncolonized people, though between 1932 and 1936 an Italian administration was brought there in the courts and everything still remained. Um, you, could, you could say that actually colonialism is rampant, but bringing it back to um, the sisters, um, this, is, this is some game that I wanna give to, to all young men watching this. As much as you know that you've been told to be a hyper-masculine man and you can't let nobody punk you and you gotta be strong and all of these things and we don't discuss emotions, eventually those emotions will overcome you if you don't deal with it and that's why we be going to prison and that's why we be going upside each other's heads all of the time. And we, that's a fact. After we've been raised that our children are born in sin and so we have to beat the hell out of them because they're born into hell because of the, the Judeo-Christian stuff, right? If you sit down with a woman and ask her how you can build with her, rather than sit down with a woman and work out a way to get into her pants, into, into, into her vagina, you are literally forming the template of that same technology that we were talking about that is the family. Whether or not, and this is the other thing about polygamy or polyandry or whatever, is it always gets sexualized. 
a lot of the husbands that Queen Nzinga or a lot of the husbands that uh, Queen Apshetso or any of the queens of old or kings of old uh, when they had wives had, they didn't have sex with them. Mm -hmm. They were administrators of their armies. They were administrators of their economy. They were the leaders of the education system. And the reason why that they were married to them is so that if anything happened to them, they can carry on ruling. Mm -hmm. Now what we have is we have this idea that everything has to be sexual. And I think that if me and you and my friend Coop and, and every, every other black man was raised in a way to be told that actually your highest calling as a man is not to have sex with women, but to build with women. And we didn't waste our younger years trying to get in the pants of women and actually built up. We would be sitting on gold thrones right now. Now that's a super fact. You just preached to the gospel right there. <laughs> you understand me, man? We can end on that point because I think that that's, that is a lot of game and a lot of jewels. You know, growing up, you know, you grow up in the Mac era, the player era, the pimp era, the bitches and hoes era, all of these different things to where, you know, hip hop will establish a culture to where you put bros before hoes. You understand me? And it's a very a homo, sexual, you know, thing. society right. or culture that was created. Um, and it made no sense, to be honest, because, you know, building with women has always been our great secret and our great power. Mm -hmm. You understand me? That when men and women relationships are restored and put back in proper place, there is not a single entity on this planet Earth that can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. When they look to use our women to build their civilization, they know she is the best conduit, the best womb to run ideas through because she is the one that everybody has been through in order to get here, right? right? And so she is the best technology in the world, right? Um, and not to objectively look at her as like, you know, just something, but when we look at the power that manifests through the black woman, any man that considers himself to be great has to then look at the woman that produced the greatness itself. Mm -hmm. That I could have not got here if it was not for the womb mm -hmm. of you being able to produce this, of who I am. Mm -hmm. So anytime we celebrate ourselves, a byproduct is that we are celebrating our women. Mm -hmm. You understand me? But we need to now directly give that appreciation to our women in real time. And when you appreciate something, you add value to it. When you are adding value, you are being a god to something by mm -hmm. adding value. When you depreciate something, you're being a devil. You are devaluing. Devaluing. So we have been devils to our women for far too long in our culture. In order to be gods to our women, we have to appreciate them. You understand me? And therefore, the most valuable thing that we have close connection and proximity to, we can now reestablish and build. And the world is ours the moment we do that. It's over, you know? So that aspect of being able to repair the family, to restore trade and order and balance and community and technology and intellect all across the diaspora is key. And I applaud the work that you do because without Shaka, there's no Shaka, mm -hmm. right? And I say that because there's certain people that hold positions to where it's like, you might not like how they do it, but if they wasn't doing it, who would be doing it, right? right? And so anytime I see a person that represents their own hierarchy their, or, or, or um, archetype, you know, into this algorithm of the world, they're appreciated because of what they added, because I know without them, then that all the people that benefit from the things you do would not be able to be able to get that value. Mm. So thank you, my brother, and I appreciate all the information and knowledge that you've given us. This has definitely been a high-level conversation all the way back to the African nation. And, and just to everybody in here, travel to Africa, do trade with Africa, Marry an African woman, marry a black woman, celebrate a black woman, build a business with a black woman and restore peace and balance to the earth because the black woman is the original woman and is why we are here on earth and the black man is the fiercest and strongest protector of that woman and the strongest and most fierce protector of those technologies and you're going to see the schools I'm going to build, the villages I'm going to build and what is created out of that and it is going to be created hand in hand or under guidance of the black woman. Most of my organization is run by black women. So. There you have it. My second outro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my second outro is the secret is to build with a black woman. I promise you. I've, I've been saying that, you know, if you want to really grow your organization, 
It's good to build with your brothers, that's cool. But women can do things that men can't, and they give birth. So if you want to give birth to something in real time, get more black women in your organization. Build with more black women. Tap in. This has been High Level Conversations with Shock the Boss. Peace. 19 Keys, and this is High Level Conversations. Tap in with the dog. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Get some mentors, as was the original, our mentor, who was looking after, I think it was Ramazizi's, uh children. You need to have people who can with wisdom and love, share their experiences with you so that you may understand who you are and where you are in this world. Uh, self-made is a, there's no such thing as self-made. We are interdependent, like the chair that I'm sat on, I didn't make, right? But it's holding me up. And so um, I think you need to get mentors, as many as you can. And, you know, when, when the, when the, the, the knowledge seeker is ready, there will always be someone to teach them that knowledge, right? And a lot of what I have learned has been given to me through people who have already done it, are doing it, or um, know that I can do it and they couldn't do it. Uh, so I, I would say get mentors and then I would also say um, be brave enough to, to be kind and compassionate and do the right thing. Um, like you need to be able to make sure that there are there 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 are going to be many points in your life where you think well this is it but always know that what you are building to is always a bigger legacy and you are always building to a a place of balance and peace and just as you know I've sat down with Keys and and other people before um, we have melanin in us that allows us to be able to know or carbon in us that allows us to be able to know ourselves in time and space that has a frequency and a vibration it's called sympathetic vibration so you need to be able to allow your melanin to resonate with somebody else's melanin so that you can be mellow together and when you have that and you have peace then you can have real creation so i'd say the first Kind of, and the main two things is make sure you get people who know what they're talking about to be able to uh, allow you to realize your dreams and then be brave enough to realize that actually you are just a piece of the puzzle. You know, you are not the entire puzzle, you are a piece of it and though significant and the puzzle can't be completed without you, you can't complete the puzzle without the people. I think Shaka Bars is an integral piece when we talk about the diaspora and we talk about solutions. Um, I think that the pieces that he had from his experience, from his travels um, throughout the world, I think is vital and I think that he has history and knowledge that all people need to be exposed to. And so, you know, anytime I have a conversation with anyone is to be able to spark more inner realization, to be able to spark enlightenment, to be able to spark um, exposure to things that you normally would have not been exposed to. You know, and uh, it's a mastermind build when there's another person who has a mastermind themselves in the way that they go about doing things. Most people may look at the results. You know, I always look at the travels and the journeys that a man take that is accumulative to who he is. And then what he showcases may seem easy, but the journey and the route towards doing that requires a lot of thinking and intellect and a lot of power and prowess. So I think that it's important that we all connect, link up people of different backgrounds, stories, ideas, values, and things of that nature, and bring it all together for one cause, which is ultimately the liberation of our diaspora. I think, and as I will inevitably um, bring keys to, to different parts of, of Africa, I think the conversation is the beginning of a journey of exploration, but then what comes next is building. What comes next is creating like long-term relationships, and um, I think be free enough to have conversations with uh, other beings who are considered leaders or other beings who who have information and don't try and assimilate that information and then try and teach that as if it's your own. Try and put them on so that you can build together and create, you know, is, is like we say in, in, in Rasta or 
you know, brother was saying before about a cipher, we have reasonings in Rasta so that we can find the reason of why we are here, right? We have a, a intellectual and spiritual foundation from which we can then build. It's not all intellectual, 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 and, and you, know, you know, trying to academically prove, you know, through debate. It's not always a debate, you know. It's actually the best things for us is not our, uh, it's not how powerful we are individually, it's how powerful we are together. And I think that the best thing that ever happened to humans was our relationship, that we were able to relate to one another so that we could then manipulate these resources in the ground to be able to build uh, spaceships and stuff that can fly into into to go i don't get all of these people out here trying to colonize mars i ain't with any of that stuff we have land here right here on earth and i think that we as people need to start looking at, at the land on earth and find ways that we can be custodians of earth again so that we can rule earth again so that earth will have peace again so i think we had a a, a reasoning and a peaceful conversation in Swahili, we call it Kuzum Gumzwa, so that we are able to relate to each other and then build together. No, I think we sat down, we had a very powerful conversation. Um, yeah, I think this was one of the ones where I listened more than I spoke because I really enjoyed the history lessons of, you know, what was happening with the Congolese over in Congo, Congo and also just listening to Shaka Bars and his stories. You know, I think it is very powerful for anybody to gain insight through his travels and journey. So I think the people go love this one. Um, you know, we get to uh, learn about, you know, him and his relationship with all these beautiful women, um, fruits, you know, his travels, how he helps out the entire, you know, world. Um, and, 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 you know, what it's like to be a man on that journey itself, you know. So this was a very high level conversation. Make sure y'all tap into it. Respect family, it's Shaka Bars here and I am here with 19 Keys and you are listening to high level conversations to higher your vibration because that is your designation, pure elevation. Zine. Yeah, 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 I know what we're going on, the black women part. Also, if you have any ideas, like, based on the conversation, if you want to title it, let me know. Okay. Okay. 32, I just turned 32 a couple of days ago. Seven days ago. Seven, one week ago. It's my brother's birthday, matter of fact. Uh, Amechi, it's his birthday. But no, I mean, you know, I, I think uh, my journey started... When my parents told me I was a guy, I lost my way a few times and then I picked it back up. You know, it's just something that's, I think it's just a part of my personality and character. You understand me? To uh, to be a thought leader, if you will. You know what I mean? To find solutions to problems, to think in ways that other people don't think, to architect and command. Like that's just my personality. So you put me in any place on the world, that's what's going to come out. If you give me a channel of media to express that, then I'm gonna be able to communicate that to the world. You understand me? And so it's always been my journey. I just fell off a few times, you know, but that's how I was reared and raised to do what I'm doing today, you know? But, you know, you get in the streets, you do a bunch of other different shit, and then different turning points bring you back to show you what you should be doing. And once you find alignment with that, we ain't stopping. I don't know if it was one, I think it was a, a compounding effect of a few different events. One of them was when I had a case when I was 19 and took it to trial and beat it. And from that point on, I decided to not learn anything unless it was conducive to my freedom. You understand me? 
And also I just seen how the system swallow up so many different people by them not having knowledge and resources. They plead out for a case or whatever it may be and they get stuck in the system forever. And it's like they ain't got no keys in it. Like they ain't got nobody that can give them some knowledge, that can give them some resources so they know how to be consistent and be successful or to stay free. So I think that everybody needs, you know, some sort of key in their life to unlock whatever is rusty in their mind. I think we all walk around with untapped potential, you know, and what I like to see is us at this ultimate place of enlightenment and power where it's like, man, these folks so high level now, they can never be oppressed again, you know, and it just consistently add to that vibrational frequency raise. Um, no, nah, it wasn't particularly legalese law in general, one, two, three, but four. just the mindset of thinking like a God, if you will, right? When I used to get in trouble, I used to always think, what would God do? That was my thought process. I remember being literally in the uh, interrogation room and my thought process, I, I used at the time, it was like, what would Master Art Muhammad or Honorable Elijah Muhammad do in this? So I would always try to think about somebody who was light years more intelligent than me, and I know that could think their way out of a situation. And I tried to do a thought experiment to see what should I say or what shouldn't I say or what should I do? Because I know that they would have a much more favorable outcome than I would. Mm. You understand me? And that was always my thought experiment I did throughout life to try to put myself in the shoes of someone more intelligent than me to get a better outcome. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think that's what we try to do now is to show people different mindsets that, you know, somebody told me, who was that? My younger brother told me the other day, he said, when I get in trouble, I now think, what would keys do? You understand me? And that meant a lot, because I never told him that story, you know? So to be able to create that example to where there's different mental archetypes that people want to put themselves into to sort of think through it, it automatically forces you to advance in that moment. You understand me? Because you're stretching beyond what you consider yourself to be to think beyond, you know, whatever circumstances that you're in. Shit. I was watching um, uh, a, a variety of YouTube channels. And one of my people said to me the other day, yo, where's your YouTube channel? And yeah. I was like, Man, fuck that. I want to do YouTube. And the reason why I, I, I had said that was because I didn't want to spend time not working on the ground, working in the realm of media or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, it's a currency, man. Can't it's, not do it. It's a currency, bro. They, it's, and then it's time. It's like, I look at everybody and be like, you may have one person working on the ground for three years. Mm another person working in media for three years, mm -hmm. right? Now the person working on the ground may eventually run out of resources and be like, this is too much to do by myself. Mm -hmm. I need to get in the media and get more people to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. The person that's doing media be like, damn, now I done got all this success. I got all this attention and resources. Now I want to funnel it somewhere, mm -hmm. right? And the question is, is what method or manner will be more efficient? Right. Because year four, is right. <laughs> what's going to matter. There's always going to be a You understand me? The first, the, the beginning stage, it matters, but not to the point of the end result. Right. You understand me? The end result is what are we going to build and what was the best way of going about it? So when I see people build, I always think about, I want to see them in the next 10 years, not just right. them in the first three years. Because sometimes we don't give people a long enough time to succeed. Right. You know, we pull them down. Yeah. They've even built we stopped anything. them while they failing and they that may be their best lesson to become successful. Right. So it's like, I don't think we've ever done that in our culture. Give people enough time to succeed. We and tear then, people down fast. 